Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave, and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. But the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand, and he's running really fast. And spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. 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 Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. If you want more bonus episodes every week, every Thursday, we drop member shows for members only to the website. With the website membership, you will get access to the app, which has all the content on it. Plus, the content is also on the website. You get the Tuesday shows ad free and you get access to overtime episodes. Today might be an overtime episode or it just might be a super long episode or it might be a three section episode where we do a public show, an overtime and a member show because we have an in-studio guest today and he brings Well, he packs a punch and he has a lot of different experiences. He is one of those guys that has lived many lives, literally, and we'll get into it. But I want to let you guys know before we get into this conversation with our in-studio guest today, this episode is presented by Broken Branch. That's BrokenBranchDesignsLLC.com. This is an apparel company. They sell a bunch of cool stuff, all topical, Mothman, Bigfoot, you know, Krakens, all that stuff, T-shirts blankets, mugs, all that stuff. And they met me at the uh, the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference and they gave me a free t-shirt, which I'm sporting right now at the time of this recording. If you're on YouTube, you could probably see the t-shirt right now in the studio. It is a sweet t-shirt and I just wanted to give them love because it feels really good on my skin and I just wanted to give them a shout out. So Broken Branch, they don't know I'm doing this, but I'm doing it. Broken Branch Designs LLC.com. Get your t-shirts and all your cool stuff there today. All right. We got Glenn here in studio. Glenn, man, what is going on? Hey, Tony. It's great to be here, man. Dude. So we were just talking before we hit record and like, I. all right. So <laughs> you're, a, you're a retired professional musician. Let me just give, give it to the people this way. You're a retired professional musician, archaeologist, historian, treasure hunter, ordained minister, and you've had encounters with orbs, UFOs, Bigfoot, Mantis, abductions, uh, 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 possibly a skinwalker in the the magical cave in Kentucky. Uh, you, you're from Kentucky. You live about two and a half hours from me. And uh, you grew up there and you have a lot of experiences from the Daniel Boone. Uh, you've been exploring a cave your entire life. That is absolutely huge. It goes back at least a mile and a half, you said. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of magical things about this cave. And uh, you've invited us to come up and check it out. Yeah. You, you've you found silver mines. With, you said you have a chunk of silver somewhere here today that you've, you've uncovered. And so it's just like... You are literally a man of many lives. But when I say retired professional musician, now people uh, that email us that, you know, that I, I have a band or, you know, 
uh, you know, I'm a retired musician and they, they toured on, you know, and they opened for bands kind of thing. Uh, you, I think the perspective really was set for me just a few minutes before we hit record because, and I'm going to let you tell, but, uh, because I, I don't even know the name of the song. It's one of those songs where like you, you sing it to yourself, but you don't know the name of it. Uh, what's the name of the song? I don't really like to brag about I, my, I, I, I know you don't, but <laughs> I, I, I just, because I, I just got to tell people like you, you, you were a drummer and you play many different instruments, but you were a drummer for a, a legendary song. Uh, it was a Rockwell song. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, all right, we'll just leave it at that then. We'll just leave it at that. Cause I, you know, but um, maybe I'll play the, maybe I'll play it as the outro or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't own the rights to that. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. But, um, but I was just like, holy crap. So, uh, yeah, we're going to get into a lot of different stuff today. And it's one of those things where we were kind of game planning beforehand. And I wasn't sure what direction we were going to go to start. I wasn't sure if we were going to do it by category, like categorize it by, you know, different topics or what, but you right. suggested that we do chronological. So, uh, we're going to do chronological and we're going to start off in your childhood. And, and it's probably best this way because it's going to let people see how it all kind of unfolded for you as your life went on. Um, but you started out in Kentucky as a kid and, uh, the weird starts pretty much right away in your life. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, it just kind of carries throughout your life. And what I find interesting is that, um, you, you, you've traveled the world. Yeah. You, I mean, you've, you've, you've lived in the Caribbean, you've, you've explored Mayan ruins, you, you've done all these different things and you wound up coming right back home you know, and, and, and now you're in Kentucky again. And we were talking last night at dinner and I think you said that you, you didn't really plan on coming back to Kentucky. It no. wasn't something that you, that was in the cards and it just happened. Yeah. And, uh, it's interesting because it, it kind of made me sit back in the moment and think, will I ever wind up going back to Pennsylvania? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> not going back. Uh, I love it here. Yeah, I so think you got a good situation. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really. Well, you you thought you had a good situation going in the Caribbean, you know, like. Oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you just never know, I guess. So it's important to say, never say never, I guess. But uh, that's true. I'm not planning on it. Yeah. So um, I'm going to, we're going to start it off there, man. And I'm going to let it hand it over to you and let's start off in early childhood. You were born in Kentucky and uh, we're going to start off, I guess, with the abduction stuff because that kind of kicks it off and it might have a lot to do with how the direction of your life went. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So um, wherever you want to start, the age uh, and, and what was going on, what was your memories, what happened? Sure. I was five years old. I was living in Lexington, Kentucky. I was adopted. Uh, my birth mother was Albanian, and I don't really know anything about my birth father uh, from a long line of musicians, uh, masons, uh, on, on both sides of the family. Hmm. But uh, yeah, I was five years old and uh, living in Lexington. And uh, at night, uh, these grays would come to my window, uh, wake me up, and uh, I would be scared to death. They'd be looking at me, and somehow they would get me out. And the next thing I would know, uh, I'm on a craft somewhere. Uh, they would always return me to my front yard outside. And there was a, a neighbor that lived two doors down. She was my age also. She would be there with me. It was the two of us. And we would just be there standing in the front yard, like in our pajamas. How did we get out here? You know? Mm go back in the house. Uh, I would tell my parents, I was scared to death. Uh, my father just thought I was having nightmares. Uh, would send me back to my room. And this continued the whole time we lived in this house, which was five, six, two years continually, you know. Uh, and I don't remember exactly what happened on these uh, abductions. I know there was some kind of testing going on, some kind of medical testing because I developed a, an unnatural fear of doctors and dentists after that. It was really, yeah, just the bright lights and the, and all that. I was just mm. terrified. Uh, so that was my first, uh, experiences with, uh, and they were grays. Uh, 
So they would come through. Where, where, how how would they come to you through the house or the window? You said the window. The yeah. window. My bed was right by the window, and I could uh, just look a few feet away and big window. And uh, and you would see them. Yeah. And then next thing you know, I'm gone. You're gone. Yeah. And and when you said they would return you, you'd be in the front lawn, and the neighbor girl was there too. Yeah. Same situation, just Same standing situation. there, pajamas. Yeah. Both of us just. How did we get here? Yeah, you know. that's interesting. I I, I know. Um, I want to say. I want to say, uh, man, I can't remember which guest it was. Uh, I think his name's Dave Emmons. Uh, I had a guest on the show that had similar experiences with the idea of uh, of of being abducted with. Oh, you know what? It was it, he actually was abducted and then ran into somebody he had seen during his abduction later uh-huh. in life, so he recognized them. But um, there was also uh, people here not too long ago, Shelley and Jr. And uh, this was a members episode. Uh, I think it was called the Predator Returns. And um, his wife talks about seeing um, kids, people being walked into a, a craft, all chained. Like a, like wow. like like slaves yeah. by the neck kind of thing. What's interesting is like because I, I think I think sometimes she she even probably struggles with did I dream this or was this real? So there's very real physical things that she recalls from these moments that uh, it, it's hard to imagine she dreamt uh, the feel, physical feelings that she had and stuff. But um, what's interesting is not long ago, and I, I still haven't checked out the link. But uh, I was driving home from the office one night and uh, there's a podcast or it's a big, huge show, Sean Ryan. I don't know if you've heard of him. Mm-hmm. Um, he's really been diving into some of the weird stuff. Which You're Talking about the uh, military guy that saw the craft in the jungle I th- where they were taking the, the human trafficking. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't, I, I didn't watch the clip. I just I, like, I, 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 I was, it. I was backing into my driveway and you know how they do like those bumpers in the beginning to show you what's coming? Yeah. I saw that and I, I just sent it to JR and I said, dude, you need to check this out. Yeah. And um, I watched that. So, so was it, was it what it seemed like that he was talking about? Like, people- it's like a black ops military, uh, really advanced hardware and stuff. No, no insignias, no identifiers. They were threatened uh, to be killed multiple times. And then they witnessed uh, this craft hovering over uh, like a granite slab, and they witnessed these big uh, like uh, like shipping containers uh, that that had ventilation and stuff on them, and they were supposedly loading. It was during a natural disaster, uh, and people disappear in a natural disaster. Haiti, so yeah, I mean, that's what that was happening in Haiti after the earthquakes. The the, the child abductions going on there. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I say all that because um, it, it just, that stuff reminds me of your experience here. Uh, you guys were returned, but theoretically all those, well, I don't want to say that. I don't, I don't know. But um, have you heard of, I think it's called the gate program. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We just did an episode on it. I don't really know that much about it. Uh, I just, somebody mentioned it to me the other day. Uh, Why they mentioned it to you? Uh, I think because, uh, my dad, Grant, all, all my, the men in my family were Masons. And this is your adopted or biological? Adopted and biological. Interesting. Yeah. And they said there was some, they believe there was some connection. So, um, I mean, I, I want to, I would actually like to uh, explore your thoughts on Masons then. Uh, but I, I would say, I, I don't know about that, but there's a lot of people who believe that the gate program, there's <clears throat> that there's segments of the gate program that are nefarious and are sub uh, programs for MK Ultra. Right. Um, I just had a lady on who was part of the gate program and she was recalling some weird things and she wasn't trying to make any more of it than what it was, but you know, she recalled like one time her and these other kids uh, had to go to a museum at the at night and sleep there next to a mummy. Oh wow! And um, it, it seemed very ritualistic, you know. And uh, but then there's other people like a guy emailed me after he heard that, and he he said he was part of the gay program and he doesn't remember anything weird about it. And um, it seems like 
because the gate program is, from what I understand, is still operating today, and it's supposed to be for gifted kids. They identify kids who are very gifted, and you know they they uh, you know further education kind of thing. And I think there are people who have experiences that are just you know normal. I think mine was normal. I mean, so you were in the gate program, gifted and talented. So you know, I, that's what they called it. Mm. They didn't call it the gate program, but yeah. and they recognized that I was gifted as an artist like a graphic artist and they mm -hmm. sent me to i mentioned i was going from elementary school and junior high to college classes later in the day taking college art classes with college kids mm -hmm. you know and i was 11 12 13 uh, so i don't know if that had anything to do with it but they labeled me a child prodigy and and that seemed to be the way my life was headed mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, if somebody labeling you a child prodigy does, wouldn't surprise me just by your life experience. I mean, your life kind of went in a direction. It's like, yeah, he was destined for some really amazing, cool things, a, a really cool life. I mean, on a very fundamental level, would you look at your life and be like, yeah, I lived a good life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope you'd say yes. Yeah. I would hope you say yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm very excited that, that I'm meeting you and getting to know you because... Um, just there, there's simple things we were discussing last night at dinner that you, you invited us up to the property about. And I'm just like, man, that, like, like we were talking about treasure hunting last night. And to me, obviously, yeah, finding a treasure would be amazing. But living in the moment, the time you spend yeah. treasure hunting, to me, is the treasure. It, it is. It, the hunt is the treasure. It is. Uh, most people fantasize about treasure hunting they yeah. watch it on tv yeah. but they never put the boots on the ground and go do it it's true and uh so just the fact of you doing that it's amazing um so the uh the masons now i know there's a lot of conspiracy theories about the masons right. and things like that and i'm not a, a mason uh stunad uh is that the wrong, that's the wrong word Aficionado. Stunad is the opposite direction I was trying to go with. I am a Stunad, but <laughs> that's funny. Uh, but um, I, I, my mind was going ahead of me because I was thinking, as I was talking, I was thinking Joel would be the guy to talk to because he is a Mason too. Yeah. Um, and uh, he actually became a Mason because he wanted to be nefarious. Uh, but I would say I, I laid that groundwork because I'm not the guy that's going to go deep on Masons and, yeah. and, and because I don't know. I'm not either. But what are your thoughts on it? The fact that your biological father was a Mason, your adopted father was a Mason. Um, have you had any experiences with either one? You said you didn't remember the biological father, I believe. Uh, yeah, I never met him. Never met him. Um, but have you had any experiences that would make you scratch your head with the idea of the Mason angle at all? Because you brought it up, so I just yeah. wasn't sure. Yeah, not not really. Other okay. than other than my dad was my adopted father was quite nefarious. I mean, was he? Yeah, yeah. I think, and I think, uh, I mean, you could just say basically he was an evil person. I mean, mm -hmm. from my my earliest memories are being physically beat by him. Okay, yeah, which continued, you know, uh, so bad that by the time I was. It would get so bad that I would, at night, I would climb up the highest tree I could find and wait till he came home and went to bed. And then my mom would come out and say, okay, you can come down. It's safe. Really? After he had, he'd try to get me down sometimes. But, so he knew you were out there. Yeah. And uh, so then I'd come in and go to bed, you know, but I was diagnosed with PTSD because of that mm. at like 12 years old or something. Uh, so he was not a was not a nice person, you know, and, and the things he did in his job too, uh, I think had something to do with the energy that was following him around. And what was his job? He was a civil engineer. And what he did was he designed and built most of the man-made lakes in Kentucky. So, uh, he'd be project coordinator, project engineer on them. But most of these lakes... <clears throat> Like, especially where I live, like five minutes away, there's a, a lake uh, below a Native American site, and they moved a whole cemetery of, like, just regular people, and then they just flooded lots of Native American graves, lots of Civil War graves, uh, just desecrated, you know. And he would, 
he would steal artifacts and and uh, bring them home, and it's just a bad energy. Mm. You know, he would take me on these job sites when I was a little kid, and you know, just watch them flooding these Native American burial grounds and burial mounds, just carelessly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. So nothing like it wasn't like he was a, a like a working in it like you because I, I forgot to mention yeah. this like you 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 actually worked in a deep underground military base at one time too so yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting we'll hit on that at some point today well uh, I know he he designed all of the the lakes and and most of the military bases around Kentucky especially that one so really yeah I don't know you know how deep into it he was I just know he was not a nice person mm. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Do you, do you, where you live now, is that where you grew up? No. Okay. No. How far away is it that you grew up from where you live now? So I grew up in Lexington. Okay. And I'm about an hour from there maybe mm -hmm. now. Yeah. In the mountains. Yeah. You're in the Daniel Boone. Yeah. Uh, we haven't even talked about, oh, we had talked about it last night a little bit. Uh, dog man and you called him puppy boy. <laughs> <laughs> But you're like it's a werewolf. It's you, know, you, know, you didn't really like the name Dog Man. Um, but uh, have, have you heard uh, growing up in Kentucky any of these these stories of the uh, the werewolf? I know we talked about it last night, yeah. but I don't know if you want to talk about that now or if you want to talk about it later. Yeah, we can talk about it now if you want. Um, I don't. I don't want to get too far off track of our chronological order and stuff. But yeah, if we want to hit on it a little bit right now, because I just hit. I, I just. ADHD, my mind goes all over the place. And, I, and when I said the Daniel Boone, I was like, I went on an expedition there once, dog man. And yeah. I was like, why don't you tell your story? <laughs> That's how my, my train of thought goes. So, uh, but you heard, I know you've heard some of these yeah, stories. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were talking about the uh, Brenton Sawin story that, that I heard that happened just a few miles from me in the next county over, uh, yeah. which I'm pretty much on the county line right there in the Daniel Boone. Uh, I can tell you what happened there if you yeah, want. Yeah, go or, for you, it. Okay, so evidently uh, there's a guy that, that lived who's a Vietnam vet, uh, totally self-sufficient, off-the-grid guy, lived out in the middle of the woods in a cabin, and uh, I believe it was Lee County or Clay County, one of the ones that borders where I live. And uh, he was such a good hunter, and, uh, you know, if he was going to kill two deer he would take two bullets he never missed you know excellent shot so uh one night he was sitting out on his porch and uh at dusk and he saw a figure come out of the woods uh and just stand there on the edge and he thought it was a person at first and warned him i'm armed you know you need to go back the way you came or i'm gonna shoot stepped a little closer and he he warned again this is your last warning if you don't leave i'm going to shoot and then it came out of the shadows and rushed him and it was a dog man werewolf puppy, puppy boy yeah <laughs> yeah it had a a poodle head <laughs> <laughs> with little ribbons in it <laughs> no so it evidently it, it it came towards him so he shot it a couple of times in the chest and it went, retreated into the woods. He knew he didn't kill it, though. So he was worried about this. So he went to a, his buddy's house that lived close by and talked to him and his nephew and told him, uh, look, this is what happened to me. Uh, I'm going to go back home. I'm scared. I'll be honest, I'm scared, but I'm going to go back home. And if something happens, do you know what happened to me? Mm. So they tried to get him to stay the night with them, and he said, no, nah, I'm not going to let it chase me off. I'm going back home, stand my ground. So about, I think it was like 2 in the morning, they get a call from this guy, and he's screaming over the phone that it's back and it's trying to get in his door. And they can hear it smash through the door. They hear the guy screaming, and then the line goes dead. So they immediately jump and get in their truck, and they drive out to this guy's property. But by the time they get there, there's already law enforcement there, sheriffs, state police, some FBI-looking guys. And he knows the sheriff, so he asks him, you know, what's going on? And he's like, you know, he, all we found was his foot 
just ripped off and there's blood everywhere. The door's been smashed in, splintered. Uh, and all he found was the guy's foot. So he keeps trying to question the sheriff and the sheriff's like, look, I can't really tell you what's going on now because we got these government guys here. But if you go home, you know, I'll get with you later and tell you exactly what's going on. So the, as they were standing there talking, they looked down and saw tracks in the dirt. And uh, the nephew kind of nudged his uncle and was like, look, look down. And when they did, the FBI-looking guys just took his foot and uh, smoothed out the tracks, made them disappear, and told him it was time for them to leave. So they left. Later, he got in touch with his sheriff friend, and his sheriff friend wouldn't tell him anything. Hmm. That was the last, you know. Some friend he is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they threatened him, evidently. Yeah. You know? But they were there just like that, you know, before they could even get there. To me, that screams uh, tracking. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Like, like I, I think, uh, so I think these creatures come from many different places. I think that some of them are, are, have been here and they're ancient. I think some of them are coming from other realms. I think that some of them are created in labs. I think the ones created in the labs are being tracked. Yeah. Maybe we have technology that can track when portals open and they're, they're on it, you know, yeah. which we'll talk about because you, uh, you, you have a picture of a portal opening up on your property. I've seen it. It's literally <laughs> probably one of the most uh, um, impressive portal pictures I've been given uh, because the first image I saw was up close and it looks nighttime. And then the second image I saw was it not zoomed in and is actually at dusk. Yeah. And it's daylight. Yeah. And you see this green portal opening up and you saw with your naked eye, you took a picture of it and I'm just like, holy crap. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, yeah. So the, I think that maybe they, they have technology that they, they can see the energy changes and they know certain signatures on the screen are like that is what we were looking for, go now. Yeah. Because something's going to happen and we need to be there to clean it up if something happens bad. Yeah. Um, but we hear we hear about that stuff all the time, you know? Um, and that's very close to this military base. That you worked at? Just, yeah, like a five-minute chopper flight or something. I, I'm intri we'll, we'll get into this too. I, 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 because there is, um, I had an episode, I think it was 444, 40, 444, uh, I called it uh, the Kentucky UFO crash cover up or something like that, and I think it's in Pi uh, uh, Pikesville, Pikesville, Pikeville, yeah, Pikeville. Is that the train? Yeah, the train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, heard about that. Yeah, and that's if I if I remember looking into it, and that incident was south of I think a rumored deep underground military base or military base. Is that the is that matching up with the one you worked at or no it would be from there it would be northeast not, okay not too far okay gotcha probably the closest base okay yeah um anyways uh before we move forward you said you shared a second one where you were talking to your neighbor yeah who uh just relayed some puppy boy content to <laughs> right <you>. yeah <laughs> so he told me about I guess back in the 20s, on this same creek below my house where the portal and, and other stuff are, is happening, uh, a family, a whole family was killed, and the only survivor was a little boy. They found him a few days later wandering in, up out of the woods, said his whole family had been killed by a werewolf or a wolf man. And uh, the family was just gone. Like and, there's no trace of them? No they were trace. just gone? Yeah. Wow. And and just him left, a little boy, you know, maybe eight or nine. Hmm. You know, it, hearing that story, um, it makes you wonder what they could have found if they had the technology we have today. You know, that's back in the 20s. Right, yeah. You know, and it, even like I, they probably wouldn't even know to look for hair. You know, uh, as far as uh, human hair, I mean, like, yeah. like looking, cause what are you gonna even do with the human hair? There's no DNA testing back then, Yeah. you know? 
Uh, and they probably chalked it up to a, a wolf or yeah. a, a wildcat or something. And the, yeah, and the kid's interpretation after seeing his whole family devoured, right. uh, which, you know, I, it doesn't, <laughs> fresh image in my mind, it doesn't surprise me that a werewolf, a dog man could, could devour people like that because uh, one, it might have been more than one. Right. Uh, but, you know, I got these pigs that <laughs> I've seen them devour <laughs> things. I'm like, holy crap. Like <laughs> just the other day I had to put down a chicken. She was sick. And so it's a beautiful thing is we, we then feed the chicken to the pigs, which, you know, it's just a cycle of life. It's beautiful. And um, the pigs, I had, I had just fed them before that. And so they weren't trying to bother with the chicken. Jack was at my house and he, he saw it. Like, I, cause I was like, watch this. Cause I wanted to show them how they just, they go at it and, right. and they, they sniffed her and then they just went back to the other food. And I was like, well, I guess uh, they're, they're not going to eat this. And then maybe he went home and like 30 minutes later, I went outside, nowhere to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> just, they're, they're, <laughs> I was just like, wow. Uh, the no trace, I mean, no feathers, nothing. They ate it all. Mm -hmm. And so um, it doesn't surprise me that something that's so gigantic, especially if there's more than one, how they could just devour uh, a body like that. Uh, and these are legends that, that are rich in the Daniel Boone. Yeah. Uh, all over it. All over. And so, um, and these are ancient areas and the, and the caves in these areas ha hold their own stories. Um, so let's get back on track to you. Uh, you had these abduction experiences. Now, how often was this happening for you? It seemed like weekly. Really? Yeah. Was uh, it the same thing every week? Same thing. And they would show up at my window at night looking at me i was scared to death but i couldn't the thing is i couldn't get up and run away uh like to go tell my parents or go in my parents room you were paralyzed I wasn't paralyzed i could i could sit up and look at them and stuff but i just had no it was like i didn't have any will really hmm. like they just you know they just took me there's nothing i could do about it and uh yeah it, it was probably weekly and it terrified me and there would be nights uh you know, I would just freak out and cry because I didn't want to go sleep in my room, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't matter, you know. Dad would throw me in there and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> deal, yeah. deal with it. <laughs> and, and, and your mom, did she just think you were having bad dreams, like you said? She was working nights. Uh, okay. Yeah. So she wasn't even at home. Yeah. So when your dad would come home, you're hiding in a tree. She'd come out and say, you can come in and go to bed. And then she'd leave and go to work. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's terrifying. Yeah, it was terrifying. Wow. Yeah. She said there'd be many times when she would wake up, hear me, and I'd be up running around the house in my sleep thinking my dad was chasing me or somebody was chasing me, you know? Wow. Okay. So uh, these abductions are happening from it's five? Yeah. Till when? It would have been probably seven Okay. When we moved to an, another place in like And they stopped. They stopped. So far as I know, I never never had any anything else happen until I guess it was probably third grade. And then I was on a, a Cub Scout camping trip down by the Kentucky River. And uh it was a whole whole troop of Cub Scouts, a few adults, you know. And uh in the middle of the night uh, I woke up and looked out my tent and I saw the drawing I sent you, that craft, probably 30 feet, 40 feet big, landing, all the lights going. And other kids started getting up and coming out of their tents and we're all watching it. And we, we actually just started walking out towards it and it came down and hovered about 10, 15 feet off the ground and released, but we waited till we all got up like kind of under it. You were that close to it? Yeah. And it released some kind of white mist that just completely bathed us to where you couldn't see anything. And then that was the last thing we remembered until the next morning. And I woke up and I was like, hey, do you guys remember seeing the, you, yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, you know, but that was all. We didn't remember what happened after the, the mist covered us. 
Did you talk to the counselors about it? The, the guys, the adults that were with you? Yeah. They didn't believe you? No, not at all. Did the other kid, so you. And it wasn't all of us. It was just a few of us. You know, like maybe 15 of us, uh, maybe half of us. And what, the others just kept sleeping? Yeah. Was it? Was there a noise that came with this that woke you guys up? No, no noise. So some of you just instinctually woke up? Just woke up. And, like it was calling you? Yeah. Just woke up and started looking out the tent, like, you know, for it. Wow. Yeah. And you all walked to the point that you're underneath it? Yeah. And it's only 10 or 15 feet above us, hovering with the lights going completely silent. And you said you were seven-ish? Yeah. No, third, third grade. Third grade, third grade. Yeah, whatever age that is. All right, so and I'm not expecting you to remember everything, but do you remember what was going through your mind as you were approaching this thing? Like, were you co like consciously thinking, "Why am I walking towards this?" Were you obviously you weren't that scared? I wasn't scared. I was amazed. It was beautiful. That's what I was thinking. Like, what is this? This is beautiful. I've never seen you know, never seen anything like this. I didn't know anything about UFOs or or whatever. This was, you know flying saucers this was before i had that knowledge at all yeah it wasn't until years later when i saw close encounters of the third kind in the theater and i was like oh that's what happened to us what do you think that is what do you think there's something about hollywood um was well, jacques, jacques, jacques filet worked on uh, was the like creative director for that movie you know he was the hmm. ufo researcher well, that makes sense then. like Pro project blue book and stuff yeah interesting there's something that hollywood tells reality through fiction yeah and um we see that a lot yeah and, and so you having that experience where a light bulb goes and you're like oh it's interesting um the other kids that experienced that, they they don't remember going to back to bed like you. Did were you all just kind of like like what was the after effect of this? Were were you was it something that you couldn't let go and you kept on thinking about? And were they the same way or or what? I mean, have you have you kept in touch with any of those kids as you grew up? No, 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 and I don't. It, soon after that, I left the Cub Scouts too. Uh, because of that? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we never talked about it other than, you know, the, the next morning. Uh, and I don't know what happened to us. Uh, and I, like I said, I didn't even really remember it. I remembered it, but I didn't know what it was. You know, I just thought it was cool, but I didn't know what it was until mm -hmm. I saw that movie. And then I was like, oh, okay. I understand now. Did you connect that to your uh, five to seven year old age yeah. experiences yeah. then? When the little, uh, when they, they're on the mountain and the little door, when the door opens and the little gray walks out mm -hmm. or whatever, it was like, yeah, it was an intense flashback. Yeah. Oh, that's the little guy. Mm hmm. Because, you know? I mean, that, that, I mean, if you're in third grade, I'm thinking that was probably like two or three years prior. At that point, then, if you if you were in third grade and it stopped when you were seven, yeah, yeah. you're probably what seven years old in first grade, something like that. So, yeah, wow. So, like, from pretty from, fresh in your mind, yeah. Wow, yeah, wow, yeah. So, um, that happens. You you connect the dots. Uh, you have this this wild UFO experience where you're that. I mean. You're, I don't want to move off this too fast here. So you're, it's 10 to 15 feet above you. Yeah. How big is this thing? Probably 30 feet, I would say, across. Okay. You know? Like a diameter? Yeah. Okay. And it's perfectly round? Yeah. Okay. And I say that because I saw the picture. You saw the picture, yeah. yeah. That, as best as I could remember, that's what it looked like, and it had the lights all around it. No sounds? No sound. Okay. And, and I don't know what that mist was. <laughs> you know, I've kind of looked into it. Sleeping gas. Some people have said that. A, a, a nest, a nest. you know, like a, to put you to sleep. Or it could be some kind of antibacterial type thing where mm. we might have something that could hurt them, you know, bacteria-wise. I don't know. Almost like when you walk through one of those little uh, pop-up tunnels that spray you because yeah. of 
COVID stuff. You yeah. Remember those? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. And so how do you move on from that? I mean, so you quit, you quit Boy Scouts. Uh, you start just going through childhood. Yeah. And it, I, it, like, it seems like, like these things are just setting the stage for your life. Yeah. And, and what I find so interesting is that like your life is not just paranormal, weird experiences. Like there, I, I, it's like you're, there's something, and, and I'm not trying to blow your head up uh, and cause I know you're, you you try, you try to be humble. Right. But there, there there's, there's something special about you. Like, most people can't say they were a professional musician for a career starting at 12, uh, which we can get into, uh, but <laughs> the big ass days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but then on top of that, I mean, all the other experiences you've had, archaeology, treasure hunting, working in a dumb, the paranormal experiences, finding the cave, the Bigfoot outside the cave. Like, it's just, there's something about you that I feel like, like certain, certain people have these markers on their life. And to me, it seems like you have a very like unique marker on your life. It opened my eyes and it made me look for, it made me a seeker. Like right after that, I found a book on Buddhism. Mm. Somebody had thrown out in their trash some LPs. So I got the LPs, which one of them was uh, Native American Apache, traditional Apache songs, which was awesome. But then the uh, the book on Buddhism, and then from there I went to Taoism, and I was already raised a Christian, so I had that background. But it made me a seeker. You know, I wanted to, to know everything, you know. So I started studying religions and how at a young age, you know, I was – you know, third, fourth grade and <laughs> my room burning incense and uh, meditating. And uh, I just found that, you know, it opened me up for a lot of experiences and opened me up to where I could see things coming 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Like, and it made me realize that, you know, you, there's a magical part of your life where if you put your mind to it, you can do anything, really, as long as you are open to seeing the past and the doors when they open. Mm -hmm. And it helped me with that. That's why my music career, I think, was so prolific. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so third grade, just stumbled across a UFO, decided to walk up to it with a bunch of kids. You you leave the Boy Scouts because of it. Um what where do you go from here? I mean, you start studying the religions and things like that. Uh, what what's the next thing that kind of pops out in your mind as to what you that isn't normal? Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, about the same time, I got interested in music. Uh, I started playing the drums, uh, and I also um, got interested in in art. And they pulled me out of elementary school and wanted me to go take classes, college classes for art. Uh, so I did that after school for a couple of years. So it exposed me to uh, college and... At a very young age. Yeah, those ideas, you know, and all of the knowledge that's there, you know. I would take my class and then I would go to the library and spend, you know hour or two just reading whatever I could read, you know, got me interested in magic and uh, that at a young age, of course, religion. Did you practice magic? Yeah, I did. Um, it works. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of positive you can do with it, but there's also a lot of negative, you know, as you know, and sometimes what you think your intention might be positive. But time has a way of shifting things around where what you think, you know, you had good intentions and, and, and it was, you thought it was positive, but it, the, the, the reality is a lot of times it comes around and bites you mm. and, you know, years later. So I dabbled in that and realized that 
it was real and it was not something that that I wanted to, you know, mess with. Yeah. You know. I stuck more I, I focused more on self evolution and meditation and and learning uh start you know how these Tibetan masters, you know, did these things and uh then that led me to meditation and kundalini and pranayama yoga and stuff later, but yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so you're, you're going to these college classes and, uh, you're pursuing, you know, music, you're pursuing art. Um, you, you start getting recognized for your music ability, which I, I find interesting that, um, so they recognized you as a, as an intelligent child. I assume. Yeah, they always said, you know, he's. He, I really had no use for school. It wasn't teaching me, mm -hmm. you know, what I wanted to learn. So, sure. so I goofed off a lot. I was a class clown and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they would, I would always get the same report card. He has a lot of potential, but he, <laughs> he doesn't focus on, you know. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> and as I got older, I would like get the book, and I would read it like in the first night or two and learn it. And then just goof off the rest of the year. And a lot of times I had teachers that recognized that. And they'd be like, if you want, you can take the test for the year now. And I would take it and pass it. And then the rest of the year, they'd let me go to the library and just, you know, hang out and read. Mm. So That's kind of cool, actually. It was very cool, yeah. Yeah, it, it, everything's so structured today. Yeah. I, it's it's that, that was something that was... Uh, I think I don't think that would happen today. I don't think so either. And it was just you know a couple of teachers that recognized that, yeah, and helped me out. So uh, teachers are recognizing your intelligence. You're taking college courses on, uh, on art, and you're being recognized as a musician at early age. Um, you, you were I think, and you told us this story last night. I want I guess maybe we can kind of go into this, and then we can transition back into more of the weird, but. Uh, it might it might lay some groundwork for the music music side of things, uh, how it all kind of started with this jazz. Was it a jazz club? It's R and B, R and B, yeah, yeah, R and B. Yeah, uh, tell tell the story how that kind of unfolded. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. So the last two weeks of being a trucker were some of the most stressful moments of my life. I had handed my two-week notice in and it, it wasn't to go work at another job, but to go and work for myself and start building Merkle Media. I tossed and turned in bed all night and hardly slept. I was terrified. Then on my new first day of self-employment, the terrified feeling was amplified even more because there was no turning back now. There were no more working overtime hours to be able to pay the bills and feed the kids. It was purely what I created. And was it good enough for the people consuming it? It turns out one great way to make those racing thoughts go away is to talk them through with someone. Therapy gives you a place to do that so you can get out of your negative thought cycles and find some mental and emotional peace. I had to personally do that to calm myself down. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash yup today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash yup. Seventh, seventh or eighth grade, I guess. And uh, my homeroom teacher was uh, uh, really, this was in the 70s, you know, so he was a really hip guy, uh, rode a chopper to school and uh, let us, he played all the newest R&B stuff for us in school and class and stuff. Uh, but he, he recognized my artistic abilities and then he found out uh, that I was a drummer because a band came to our school and they got me up on stage to play a song, you know, and mm -hmm. And uh, so he was like, wow, you're really good. Uh, I know a band that's looking for a drummer, you know, it's on Sunday, Sunday nights, it's an R&B club. And, you know, 
it pays 50 bucks a night. And I was like, yeah, I'm there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I would go to this club on Sunday nights. My mom would drop me off and, uh, uh I stuck out. I was a little kid, you know, with all these adults and, uh, it was an R and B club. So it was mostly, uh, playing, you know, funk and R and B, that type of stuff. And these guys were just like, whenever, uh, you were in the groove or, or a good drummer or, or feeling it, they would say, man, that song, your, your ass was so big on that last song. You were holding down that groove. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the, the big ass story came in. But yeah, I, I, and I fell in love with it. I just realized, oh, this is what I want to do. I knew right then, this is going to be my life. You know, I just knew right away, I'm going to be a professional musician, mm -hmm. you know. And so you were. And so you were. Most people, like like for me, I, I grew up and I'm like, uh, at an early age, fell in love with basketball. I'm like, I'm going to be an NBA player. Never <laughs> happened. But for you, it happened. <laughs> I was like, how hard can it be? You know, had no, no, uh, no gauge as to the actual skill level it takes to be playing right. at such high levels in the sports world, let alone the music industry. And the music industry is filled with very talented people who don't uh, ever get recognized for that talent. You know, it's true. It's 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 a hard industry to break into for sure. And I had some kind of, I have some kind of, I don't, I'm sure other people, lots of people have it, but musicians, but where I could, I can hear a song. It's like a phonographic memory. I can hear a song and then it's just there. I remember it. I can hear it once and then play it. Uh, it's just always been that way. So that helped me out in the music business, you know, uh, being a hired gun, you know, they would hire me like in, when I was out in LA, come in and, you know, play on a record or got to learn uh, two hours worth of music to go on tour with this person. Mm. And I could do that really quick, quicker than anybody else in my circle. So I got a lot of gigs that way. And uh, I don't know why, but it's just, something I'm able to do. <laughs> when you're, when you're listening to a song and you pick it up like that, do you have to be focused in on the song and listening and int listening intently? Or is it something that just, it's going in your ears and it's almost like as it goes in your ears, it writes down on a piece of paper in your brain. And you just, you just have it. Both. Like, uh, a lot of times I would go to sleep with headphones and the song. So it was happening, you know, and while I'm sleeping subliminally mm. and I'd wake up and, Put the song and be like, oh yeah, I know that, you know. That's wild. So, or I can just listen to it, uh, you know. And depending on what style of music and what everything, I can really hone in and focus on stuff, or I can just be like, oh, okay, that's that and that and that and that. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, got it. Wow, that's impressive. That's impressive. As somebody who doesn't play any music, very impressive <laughs> to me. Um, but. W while you were in LA and doing the music stuff, and I, I have no idea, but I just wanted to ask you before I forget, uh, have you ever experienced any kind of like weird stuff with the LA Hollywood scene and stuff? So much. That's really? why I left. Really? Yeah. Okay, we'll get into it. I don't want to jump the gun. I don't want to jump the gun. We'll get back to the childhood. But we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll dive into the weird, you know, weird stuff that happens out there. Um, Hence, he's back in Kentucky. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, I'm going back home. Uh, but uh, yeah, you took the the long road back home, but did, he did yeah. go back home. Uh, so where do we go from here? I mean, you, you had that experience uh, with the UFO as a Boy Scout. Uh, your your childhood still. Uh, I know we, we. I don't know when the scoop scar comes in, where you you send as pictures adult, yeah. as an adult. So where are we going here with the weird in your life? Um, let's see the next place i guess would be as far as extraterrestrial stuff um or as, anything whatever you, wh whatever is the next in your life i think as i'm talking to you more it is important that we just lay the groundwork on your life and 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 let's not try to skip things to keep it on okay. topic let's just let's talk about your life because i think at the end of it you know there's a lot of people that's going to listen to this and they're going to they're going to be able to be like oh well he said this happened when he was a kid Maybe that's why this happened at 20, right. you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's important that we just kind of talk and, and let the yeah. groundwork be laid. So wherever you want to go. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, 
did a lot of touring, moved to LA, did the whole Hollywood scene, uh, moved to Memphis. Uh, so, so when you were a kid, uh, after that UFO experience, there, there wasn't a whole lot of weird then after that. No. Okay. No. Other than, uh, uh, I told you about the family farm. Uh, there was weird stuff there as far as, you know, it's a huge farm, thousands of acres, and, and we had lots of livestock, cattle, uh, lots and lots. So we would find uh, dead cattle all the time because we were just, we would roam, you know, we were just kids just roaming free on the, on the farm. And uh, we'd come all the time, find mutilated cattle dead with, uh, circles cut out of them, no blood, uh, weird, you know, you know, I'm not pro we're probably junior high age. Okay. You know? And, um, it's in between this farm is in between two air force bases, uh, very close. And occasionally the air force jets would fly over and part the trees. That's how that low. Yeah. Wow. But, we didn't know anything about cattle mutilation. We were just like, oh, there's a dead cow, but it's weird because, uh, you know, part of its mouth is cut out. It's missing an eye. It's missing its tongue. No predation, you know, no coyotes or anything and have circles cut out on the backside. And mm -hmm. uh, we just, we didn't know what to think about it. We just, well, there's a dead cow. It's weird, you know, and just go on. So nobody had any thoughts as to, you know, the idea of it being nefarious? No. So, so you, hold on. nobody thought it would be nefarious that there's, the tongue's cut out? It's missing his tongue? We were the ones, <laughs> the kids, uh, we were, <laughs> we were all adopted on, on like all that side of the family and basically farm hands, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they stick us out in the fields to do the work. You know that that type of stuff, yeah. and they just stay around and do what close to home and do stuff. And you know, we may say we saw a dead cow in in the, this pasture, you mm -hmm. know, but we had so many, so many cows. It wasn't like a nobody went out to investigate. So you would just let it sit there, and yeah. nature would take care of it over yeah. a few days. Yeah, gotcha. Did you ever notice that uh, the cattle that were mutilated? wouldn't go bye-bye and they would just oddly sit there and nothing would touch it? Well, yeah, because uh, a lot of the times when we'd find them, they would be, you know, you could tell they'd been dead for a while. Mm. But like I said, no predation, no coyotes or no uh, insects or whatever. We would just leave them there. You know, eventually they would just kind of turn into mummies or whatever, you know, just... Yeah. So like it, so it it's that that's not natural. So no. So I mean, a dead animal, especially that size, you would think coyotes would come in and have a heyday, eat on it. Yeah, and that and wasn't the, happening. And then the insects, yeah, wouldn't happen at all. Hmm. You know, you'd you know you'd run back up on one. You know, oh, it's that same dead cow there. We didn't pay any attention. No. Yeah, that's interesting. So <coughs> yeah, it seems like um, so the, so the the adults didn't venture out that far. That was your job. Yeah. So it's like, okay, dead cow. Okay, so we just got to make sure we birth another one at some point. Yeah. Uh, and as kids, you're seeing these mutilated cows. Nothing is eating them. It makes you wonder, you know, it makes you wonder the idea of like maybe radiation or something that animals can sense that they're like, I don't want to eat that because that's going to kill me. Well, since then, I've talked to like... Uh a couple of people, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, she's mm -hmm. delved into that subject. And, and I guess sometimes they found like, take a Geiger counter out and they found higher, high levels of radiation around these, uh, mutilation. So does she ever offer any idea as to why there'd be high radiation around those areas? Like, like, is it what happened to the cow that left radiation or is there radiation there? And that resulted in the cow? Mutilation or what? It's probably what happened to the cow. Somehow, some radiation involved. I don't know. Uh, but I, I know that recently uh, at that ranch 
uh, were they got a TV show about um, what Skinwalker Ranch? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they uh, just recently they were went to some cattle mutilation sites where the cows had been there for quite a while and and got spikes in radiation, uh, just mm-hmm. weird, you know, high radiation levels. So um, I don't know if I said this on a recording before, but um, a few as at the, t- at the time of this recording, a few weeks ago, uh, Jack and I went up into the mountains uh, to with, with Brian from Black Mass Paranormal, and uh, Brian had been up there all day. Uh, Brian, Brian is a local guy; he hunts local legends and goes out, puts himself in the environment. I love that about him. He just kind of goes, does it sees what happened. He's very aware of the weird stuff happening around him. Um, and he's up there all day and we were working, so we couldn't go up with him, but we went up later in the afternoon for a few hours. I would say about two hours. Uh, we met him at Abrams Falls mm-hmm. and um, it's the area where Michael Heron went missing. Now, the story of Michael Heron is interesting because he's a local guy uh, from this town and he went up into the mountains. He had a farm up there that he was farming. And he was going up to cut the lawn. He he drove his truck up there, uh, had a, his lawnmower on the back of a trailer. He gets to the house and he leaves his gun, his phone, his wallet, everything in his truck, hops on a four-wheeler and drives off down the road. He drives off down the road. He passes a neighbor, waves at the neighbor. And that neighbor is the last person to ever see him. When he waved at the neighbor, it wasn't like paranoid or anything. It was just, hey, how you doing? Like he was going for a ride. Nobody, he goes missing. They start searching for him. They finally, uh, after days of searching, they find his four wheeler. If I remember correctly, it, they found his four four wheeler. The key was in the on uh, the on position, and it was so it was like left running, totally out of gas. And they say it's like he just was gone, like like something. So if you want to think cryptids, you can say that. Uh, something jumped him, took it just jumped him, took him off the four wheeler. It coasted to a stop, ran out of gas, and he's gone because a dog man or a puppy boy or Bigfoot <laughs> yeah. got him, right? Uh, but then there's these other thoughts that people are having uh, with interdimensional aspects like time slips and did he go somewhere? Uh, was there a portal that opened up? There's a lot of portal talk up in these Smokies. Um, I, later, I'm going to be having a guy here in the studio who's worked for government type agencies and uh, he has some information to share about the Smokies and the Appalachian Mountains where uh, talking about portals, ancient pyramids in the mountains that are kind of hidden. And so I'm looking forward to having him in studio, but there's a lot of talk about this portal stuff. So we go up there. He had, Brian had been up there all day and walking around investigating and Brian had bought, brought a Geiger counter thinking that if a portal is opening up, if this is a portal location, maybe there's some radiation involved with it. Right. Uh, we don't know, just trying things, right? So uh, he gets out the, it, for the first time in the entire day, he gets out the Geiger counter when we're there and uh, I'm holding it and we're looking at it and it's just jumping from zero to like this little tiny number. I didn't know what to make of it, but I wasn't very worried about it. This is at Abrams Falls? Yeah. And then we uh, we go walking around. We found a four four toe footprint. Uh, Jack and Brian both saw something black walking across the creek uh, on the other side of the creek. I should say, not across the creek, but uh, we were on one side and whatever it was, I didn't see it. Uh, and Jack was filming, but he looked at the footage. He could he didn't see it on the footage. Um, we're walking back, and we're making our way back to the trucks to end the day. Brian was out there all day. He's exhausted. Uh, and the Geiger counter starts getting higher numbers. It starts getting these higher number hits. And I'm not th- like I'm not thinking anything about it. Like I'm just like, whatever. Like I recognize it. We're looking at it, all that stuff. We're acknowledging it in the moment, but I'm not worried. Like I'm not like, whatever, you know? I don't know how to read this thing. I don't know what a good number is or what a bad number is. If it, it, is any number bad? I don't know. Right. So whatever, you know? Um and then uh, we, we end the day, we go home. Uh, the next day, Brian texts me and he says, how you feeling? And I was like, fine, why? And he said that he was, uh, he woke up in the morning and he said his entire body, all the skin on his body felt like it was on fire. Oh no. He said he couldn't open his eyes. His eyes were, felt like they were on fire. And um, I was like, that sucks, bro. Like, uh, I feel fine. Sucks to be you. <laughs> uh, I said, I'll check, I'll check with Jack, but you know, I'm feeling great. And, 
good as can be. And uh, I text Jack and I said, how are you feeling? And, he's, and, and I, with no context, uh, he comes back and says, I was throwing up at, at all night. Oh, no. And I was like, sucks to be you, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I told him what happened with, uh, with Brian. And, uh, you know, I was like, I feel great, you know. So it must be the Puerto Rican blood, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's the only thing I could figure. Uh, but, yeah, so we had, we had that, the, the, the radiation aspect there. Um, and with the cattle mutilations and the, the radiation involved there, obviously you don't know if it was involved, um, here in Kentucky cause you didn't right. read it. Right. But out in Utah, if there was radiation at the mutilation site there, and I know that they're talking about portals a lot right now on the show, there might be some common threads here to pull at, you yeah. know? Uh, and so it might be worth, uh, getting a Geiger counter out to your location, out to that area and start just, but first you have to learn what you, how to read it, I guess. Cause yeah. it's like, well, I don't <laughs> freaking know how to read it. So, I mean, what's a dangerous level. I mean, it's kind of important to know that in case you start getting readings, exactly, you know? yeah. uh, but uh, it's interesting. Now you had these, these uh, cattle mutilations. Uh, you have no idea what it is. Do you ever recall having any kind of physical side effects after seeing these things or being around these mutilations? No. And no. none of the other kids either? No. Interesting. Yeah. Not that I can recall. And, and you guys never had uh, any thought of any nefariousness. You just was like, oh, it's a dead cow again. Right, yeah. Wow. So only looking back on it is when you're exactly. like, wait a second, the mouth was cut out, the yeah. tongue. How did that actually happen? <coughs> you know? Yeah, I saw um, uh, in one of Linda's books maybe glimpses of other realities. I'm not sure, but she had pictures of cattle mutilations. Mm. And I was like, that's what we saw. Exactly. Wow. That's interesting. And that was the first time I'd, you know, thought about it since. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, cattle mutilations is something that isn't often socialized uh, or associated with uh, certain areas. And I have found that cattle mutilations happen a lot all over the place. A very common thing, though, is catamulations happening near military bases. Yeah. Uh, and you said that this property is right between, right between two. two Air Force bases. Yeah. And uh, I know Shannon mentioned there was a guy in Kentucky that does research into cattle mutilations, but okay. I haven't linked with him yet. But so it's, it's people are aware of it. Yeah. You know, going around the farms in Kentucky. So the, your farm isn't the only farm that had this happening? No. Is it still happening today? Do you know? Probably. I don't know. Uh, not on our farm because we no longer uh, have livestock. Okay. Yeah. Is it still in the family, the farm? Yeah. Yeah. You have access to it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you go there often? No. It's it's a little farther than five minutes, five down, the minutes down the road. <laughs> yeah. Just so people understand, like you typically only travel about five minutes within where you live. Yeah. I'm, and I have no idea how you agreed to come here to meet with me, but... Uh, I'm grateful, <laughs> but I got to return the favor and come up to you next time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a battle. I wrestled with myself and really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've experienced some pretty traumatic car accidents. So you, you yeah. typically don't like riding a whole lot. Yeah. I usually have a guy drive me around, Yeah, but he was off being a rock star this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Recording stuff or yeah. other stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you, you had those experiences as a kid with the cattle mutilations on the family farm. Uh, when did you, what age was, range was this? From probably, let's see, as far back as I can remember, because we were, you know, three, four years old out, just for Roman. Mm. Uh, but when we were working, that would have been like, uh, 12, 13, you know, we had dirt bikes and we would rustle, you know, round the cattle up and move them from pasture to pasture and, yeah. uh, do cowboy stuff, but yeah. So it was that age, you know, junior high. Mm, okay. Uh, you mentioned about how uh, even as a kid you would explore this cave that we're going to get into later. Uh, was there ever anything, any inkling that there's something different about the cave as a kid? Just uh, well, you've seen it. It just looks magical. It's amazing. It looks so out of place for. Looks like something, you know, 
You drunk. could live there. Yeah. 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 And I guess when Daniel Boone was in the area, he did. Yeah. You know. And uh yeah, when when I was a kid, uh high school age is when we started going there. Uh like we found petroglyphs and uh so I knew just besides the beauty and magical feel of it that, you know, people had been going there forever and ever as they'd left petroglyphs and mm -hmm. um there had been a, a couple of deaths there um, where the water comes out of the cave into that nice turquoise pool. Well, part of that pool goes down and down bottomless. Really? Yeah. We drove a tractor down there from uh, the barn, which is maybe five miles up on top of the mountain. And this is down in the valley. We had a hundred foot logging chain. We were going to see if we could see how deep it was it never hit the bottom there was a some scouts there on a on a trip and one or two of them drowned there so it's from like an underwater current maybe yeah like probably see a lot of uh, kentucky is karst uh geology it's limestone riddled with caves uh you know mammoth cave largest mm -hmm. cave system in the world still not all explored a lot of those caves run completely across the whole state like you could travel you know hundreds of miles in them uh so uh, i don't know where i was going with that but it's 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 there's a lot of caves a lot of uh you know so this cave, uh, it it has this this beautiful turquoise pool of water oh, outside yeah. the entrance, yeah. and the water flows from out of the cave into this pool. Yeah, but uh, in this area, because of the karst topography, there's a lot of sinkholes, and uh, like you'll be walking down a creek, and you'll just see where the bottom of the creek is falling out into this nice big blue hole, you know, and you know it it may. You know, goes down into a cave system. You don't know where. Yeah, and uh, that's what I was thinking. And some of these, you know, they can create. They can have like a vortex or or a whirlpool or some kind of current that can mm -hmm. pull you under. You know. So the the uh, the the see here, here's what I'm thinking. So if it's just a, bo a bottomless, like it goes down into a cave, it, it from the pictures at least, and even the video, it. It doesn't seem like the water that uh, is going out into it is pumping enough to keep that pool filled if it's being dumped. Yeah. So I imagine there's probably some kind of water system underneath that's pushing up as well. Exactly, yeah. And that's, it's just that bottomless though. And yeah. That's wild. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. It really makes you wonder where that water goes. Yeah. And and then there's the you know there's an underground lake in the cave that in order to get to you gotta you gotta dive down into like a maybe a four foot pool of water and swim about maybe fifteen or twenty feet through a passage and then underwater it, yeah and then it opens up into this big underground lake. How big is the lake? I haven't seen it all. I mean. It goes for a while. It's pretty huge. Is there a shoreline? Uh, no. No. So it's just like this giant cavern of water yeah. that it opens up. But there's air down there. Yeah. So, I didn't explore it because it was, uh, you know, scary. And <laughs> how long ago was this for you? <laughs> I was in high school then. High school. Yeah. Wow. Now I, I probably, you know, if I'm, I'm probably get my wetsuit and, you know, wow. A GoPro and go for it. Yeah. <laughs> How far back is it in the cave? Uh, oh, it's just that big room where we would camp. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start to walk, okay, you walk back about 100 feet, and then you come to that pool of water. you got to walk through that pool of water about six feet to get to go through the rest of the cave. So it's right at that pool you can... Wow. This cave sounds uh, like, well, like you said yesterday, magical. 
I, I uh, you said something. I forget what you said, but I, I, I questioned you about the cave, and you're just like, "It's magical, man." <laughs> it is. <laughs> it, it is. It, it, so it, it's. I can understand how there's uh, petroglyphs down there. It seems like it would be a hub, a long time ago. Yeah, uh, a, a place for, for shelter, and um, Daniel Boone. Did he stay there? Did he live there, or what? He stayed there, camped there, camped there. Yeah, and. Uh, the the creek that it's on has a telling name. I'm not going to say what creek it is because it would give sure. the location away. But yeah, it's you know he camped there. It's wow, yeah, wow. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, so in high school, you guys explore this cave uh, outside of your just imaginations and exploring. There was never you know anything that was like holy crap kind of thing. Like, no. There's something weird about this place. No, never. And and our, our mindset was, uh, you know, we were high school kids. We'd take a boom box and crank it up and party, walk through the cave, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> listening to Rush or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's back in the 80s. Yeah. You just, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, okay. So you guys explored the cave a lot and, uh, I, it sounds like there's more to explore in the cave to this Definitely, day. Definitely, yeah. We didn't explore. We didn't touch it, you know. You said you've been back about a mile and a half, two miles into it? Yeah. It's uh, the water that flows through the cave. It comes in at that other entrance. So you walk all the way through the cave and you can come out and that's where the water flows in. So you've been to the other end? Yeah. Yeah, you can walk all the way through and then you can come out and just kind of walk around the mountain. There's a path, and it'll bring you right back to that great big pool of water mm -hmm. outside the cave. So, uh, but this cave isn't just a straight shot. There's other. There's other. There's offshoots. Offshoots. Yeah, and that's what you, you're talking about. You haven't explored all. Right. That. Yeah. Just just a few. Is it is it has just a few offshoots? No, we've only explored maybe two or three. Gotcha. Yeah, but there's many more. Yeah. And is it something that you you just didn't have the time to explore, or was there a reason why certain areas it was impossible, or what? Basically, the time. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, we'd we'd go there a lot, and then we'd be like, oh, well, let's go check this shoot off, you know, and you, you know, follow it to a dead end sometimes, and then mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. And when's the last time you were at the cave? It would have been the last. End of last summer. Okay. Yeah, I went. I haven't been back to camp overnight. Uh, since? Since uh, my face-to-face -face encounter. With Bigfoot? Yeah, which was in, uh, what was it? 2013? Really? Believe, yeah. What were your thoughts about Bigfoot before then? I had no thoughts about Bigfoot. Mm. I didn't even know about Bigfoot. When I was a kid, I saw the legend of Boggy Creek at the theater when it came out, like before another movie or something. It was like the preview, you know, and it scared the hell out of me. Uh, I didn't know it was a Bigfoot. It was just, the, you know, they didn't say it was a Bigfoot or whatever. Yeah. But it, I forgot about that, you know, because I spent a lot of time in the woods. It scared me for that next hunting season. But after that, I just forgot about it mm. and didn't even know about Bigfoot until... uh the TV show Finding Bigfoot, really, mm. yeah. So, how'd you get linked up with Bobo and Cliff? Because <laughs> I know you're friends with them. Yeah, uh, I, I guess it was about 2010, maybe. I, I found out about the BFRO and and that they had a Kentucky branch and a website. So I put my report, uh, my report of my encounter, and Matt saw it. So Matt called, I guess, the local Kentucky guy who uh, to investigate, but he wanted to set up like an expedition where people pay to come. He didn't just want to come and investigate with me. Like, let me show you, you know. Yeah, they wanted to make money. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's cool, you know, but yeah, yeah. but that's not. It's not what you were no, trying to do. No, so I I didn't I, I didn't meet up with him. 
But uh, so then Matt told Cliff, and Cliff called me. I was like, hey, Bobo and I've got this podcast. We want you to come on and tell your story. I was mm-hmm. like, all right. So it was like episode 58. You know, they just pretty much started out. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's how we linked up. And, gotcha. And uh, been friends ever since. And, mm. Yeah, because I, I, I was just, I was at the <coughs> conference this past weekend and Moneymaker was there, Cliff was there, but uh, Bobo wasn't there, but Renee was. Yeah. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk with Moneymaker much uh, at all. But uh, I, I spent time um, sitting around a table talking with Renee and and Cliff and Matt Pruitt. And, yeah, um, just really good people. Yeah, really really good people. Um, we don't we don't agree on everything. Right. Right. Yeah. But it, it was refreshing. Clearly, I'm I'm I'm, I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I, I say some crazy. And you don't things. have to agree with no. Me. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, it was refreshing to be able to just kind of talk yeah and and uh and not worry i got i got a real sense that i could pretty much say anything and they would be like i don't think so but <laughs> that's cool that you think that yeah you know what i mean yeah. that's, that's uh, true <laughs> you know, i just wanted to sit there and just go portals <laughs> you know like, <laughs> like it, it's uh I, I just i just i was so bad just wanted to be like okay let's 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 just lay the groundwork Cliff. here you know <laughs> but um uh, shoot maybe one day we'll have them on the show here uh that'd be kind of cool but yeah um anyways we we kind of went down this little path here because but getting back to the cave uh so the last time you were there was last at the end of last summer yeah uh is this a spot that has ever become frequented by po- like a popular location for people to hang out at? I mean, no, it's, I, I imagine it's the opposite because it's the, opposite, the kids yeah. these days don't go outside. Right. <laughs> Which is actually True. probably a good thing that the, the, because if you think about it, like, you know, I, I'm kind of old school. I was just talking to my wife the other day about, I was like, our kids don't go outside. They tell them to go and play on the sidewalk. It's 95 degrees out. Just tell them to go, <laughs> you know, throw some water at them. Uh, yeah. But Go out and play in the sprinkler. Yeah, but it's interesting because, you know, all these, well, some would say sacred locations, whether they're actually sacred or just to us sacred, um, are being protected by technology and the youth being distracted. Right. I mean, that case sounds like a place that if it was really well known would have graffiti everywhere. Yeah, it would. Ruined. Yeah. It has some from people in the past, apparently. Yeah. But uh, No spray paint, though. No, no, oh, it's not spray paint? No, it's, it's oh. just, just carvings. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So you're just leaving your your mark in time. Yeah. Even my petroglyph that I left was yeah. a carving. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> That's cool. Because when you said when you because it was a Van Halen, right? Yeah. 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 I, I was like uh, I was like dang man that graffiti but no if it's carved that's different yeah it's, and it's and it's just their VH logo okay they had on the yeah that's cool <laughs> youth has to be youth that's uh, right yeah so but yeah it's it's private so uh, private property yeah how do you get on it then. I've been friends with the family since gotcha. you know, high school. They so. don't mind you going back there. No, I'm I'm like the only person they'll let. Will they let me go back with you? They would. Okay. And th- they let me take who I want, but they don't let anybody else go. And um, you know, I it it took a few years for me to get their oh their blessing to go by myself or take other people. Really? Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't they, just like oh yeah, I remember you from you know. No, I mean we. You know, like I said, I, uh, I'm i really tight with this family. I uh, played in bands with the older sister, the next brother, and the next brother. All three different bands, mm. different times. And even worked for the grandfather as a plumber. Uh, what have you not done? I know. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, his grandmother would feed us lunch every day, and or his mom would feed us lunch every day, and... You know, so real tight with the family. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So uh, this cave is, is something that was part of your childhood, uh, kind of left to memory for a long time yeah. as you went through life. Yeah. Um, where where does this... Uh, so, so like, we talked about you being a musician. Uh, do you look at archaeology and historian in the same vein? So, like... If, uh, like when you say you're when you say you're an archaeologist, is this like an amateur archaeologist or no, are you I'm trained? You're trained. Yeah. How did uh, that whole? I uh, 
I just got interested uh, as a young kid. My older cousin was going to University of Kentucky studying archaeology and anthropology. She took me on a dig when I was about sixth grade, maybe, and I found some spear points and, you know, holding a spear point that's 10,000 years old or 9,000 years old, mm -hmm. you know, I got hooked. I just, I loved it. Uh, she eventually became the state archaeologist, uh, and I got interested in it. Uh, of course, I was on the road and traveling and stuff, uh, so I didn't do anything with it until uh, the early 90s. I guess I just finished a tour with Sweet F.A. and moved back to Kentucky and uh, started exploring and and. When I got this property, um, there was a, a helicopter crash. Uh, it was wintertime. And uh, so the NTSB and state police and all the law enforcement was out looking for this crash. On your property? Yeah. You owned it at the time? Yeah. Okay. It didn't crash on our property, but they thought it may have. They found it eventually somewhere else, more towards that creek. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we were walking around looking for this, and I was with one of the law enforcement guys, and we ran up on some guys looting this archaeological site. Actively right there? Actively looting burials and taking bones and beautiful artifacts. What, native? Yeah. They were, and they were down there with the sh shaking. <laughs> So loud, they didn't hear us walk up behind them. Wow. Caught them right in the act. The thing is, though, the law enforcement guy I was with was a local guy. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's the school teacher. And that's so-and-so. Oh, they're good. They're good old boys. And I'm like, no, they're not. They're, they're looting property and destroying burials. Oh, they don't mean any harm. We're just, we're just collecting rocks. I said, well, how would you like it if I came over to your family cemetery and dug up your grandma and sold her bones on eBay? Yeah. Oh, well, that's different. Look at how is it different? These are my ancestors on my property. How is it different? Yeah. You know? And they did nothing happened to them, but I found that archaeological site because of it. So I got together with uh, the state archaeologist who was from England uh, and had written this book, a textbook that I had read probably 10 times uh, on archaeology. And I had studied, I don't know, studied hard for probably five years, learning everything about archaeology. Then I met this state archaeologist, and he's asking me where I got my doctorate from. And I'm like, I'm self-taught. He's like, you taught yourself all of this? He's like, you know more than any of my graduate students. I was like, by the way, I got this book. Can you autograph it for me? <laughs> He's like, you bought that? He's like, you're one of the two people who bought that <laughs> You're the guy that bought that book? Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I read it 10 times. Would you sign it? Wow. So mom fixed us some lunch, and then we went out and walked and, and went to the, the site. And I showed him some artifacts that I'd found. And uh, so we got the university out there and did a proper excavation and turned out uh, through carbon dating charcoal and various, you know, you can look at lithics like points and tell when they were made by the style. There's different styles. Like I could look at this uh, Kirk corner notch pine tree point and tell it was, you know, that's 9,000 years old. And because of the slant on the left side, you can tell, oh, it's made, the same guy made this one too, mm. same person, you know. So we dated it, uh, radiocarbon dating to uh, over 12,000 years, which rewrote the history books for Kentucky because they didn't think Native Americans actually lived in the state before that. They thought they just came and shared it like as a happy hunting ground with, you know, they would just come in and hunt and leave and maybe have little camps. Why would they think that? I don't know. It was just what the history had, mm. you know. Pointed uh, towards. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but we changed that. Uh, and 
And now there's lots of excavations going in the National Forest right around there. Really? And uh, so after this, he asked me to come work at UK, University of Kentucky. So I did. I went and worked at the anthropology department, and I was his number two guy there, which kind of ruffled the feathers of the original number two guy. But, I imagine. But I, I had more experience just, you know, and he gave me the keys to this huge warehouse where they just have tons of artifacts, like wow. just a warehouse full of artifacts from Kentucky. And you could just go look yeah, at them? Yeah, and tons of maps. It was just like heaven for me, you know? Yeah. So I did that for a, a couple of months, but there again, the drive, yeah, it was about a 45-minute drive, 40 minutes more than my... Your comfort zone. Yeah. So I, I, I quit in doing that, but uh, you know, still, still uh, interested in archaeology and, sure. and history, and still doing it. You know? Yeah, wow, yeah. wow. Uh, I know we talked about we were we were kind of talking about this uh, earlier, but um, let's keep talking about this this archaeology aspect here. Uh, where does the exca excavation of giant come in play here are we talking about in kentucky or yeah. what yeah so there's a place called indian fort mountain and uh it it was a site they uh dated it to adena hopewell and what they call the fort ancient society but it's actually probably a lot older than that and it's right on this path called the warrior's path and this path goes from like florida through tennessee through kentucky all the way up to the great lakes uh, where they would mine copper. So, Indian Fort Mountain, uh, when you're standing on top of it, it's called the Pinnacles, uh, there's there's a great big stone sacrificial altar like you would see at a Mayan temple or an Aztec temple where they used to perform sacrifices. It was fortified. Uh, they built walls to protect, keep people from accessing the summit. And if you're on the summit... And Who's you, they? The people of the past or people today have... Uh, the past. Okay. Yeah. So maybe other other warring tribes. Okay. Or, yeah. So if you're on there, on top, and you look out uh, to the southwest, there's a, um, a mountain, a knob called Pilot Knob. And it looks like, I think I showed you a picture, a natural pyramid. Mm -hmm. It's like... And they used it as such. And they built these earthworks all around uh, this area for their houses and uh, ceremonial buildings and stuff. And um, I discovered these earthworks. They're previously unknown. But uh, there was an excavation done. I worked on with... Uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and, and Brea College. And uh, we excavated Indian Fort Mountain and found uh, a burial of an eight-foot-tall chief shaman, maybe, with uh, had a hammered copper skull cap and three pieces of hammered copper breastplates and uh i've got slides of those but uh yeah so this guy was eight feet tall and uh you know i don't know <laughs> that that's just it i mean what do you think about that because i mean we we hear people uncovering giant bones of the past here in this country and the bones go mis disappearing yeah. they mis they go missing they disappear um people say the Masonian is covering things up uh i've i there's a guy who regretfully i, I wasn't able to get in the studio next time he's in town but he was a guest for episode 17 i believe uh jason and i believe he's the one who told me that when he was a kid his grandfather would told him that that when his grandfather was a kid here in tennessee they were digging up these giant bones. Yeah. And um and it's like supposedly it's not true. It's not real. Yeah. But you're sitting here telling me you were part of a, a dig 
where that you dug up an eight foot tall skeleton. It's real. And uh, Squire and Davis did a survey of most of the burial mounds in the Ohio Valley, uh, I think for Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it's really a thorough survey, archaeological survey. But uh, they list many, many large burials, eight foot or more. And there's so many. I mean, you know about all the the news reports over the years. Uh, eight foot skeleton found in burial mound. You know, the head, the skull was so large it could fit over a man's head. Uh, that type of thing. Rows mm-hmm. of double teeth, six digits on fingers and. Did toes. you have any of that on this skeleton? No, it was just big. I mean, that probably could have. Yeah, I'm sure the skull would have, uh, you know, fit over like a helmet, mm-hmm. but. Of course, we didn't try that. <laughs> wow. But yeah, it's real. Uh, and, you know, the a lot of them were, I think, were taken by the Smithsonian and, you know. Do you it, think they destroy it or do they, th- they hide it? I think they hide it. Why? If you're going to hide it, why not destroy it so you don't have to worry about hiding it? But there are cases of them destroying s- stuff too. Uh, you know, uh, there's... Uh, they would just dump lots of bones in rivers, you know, just to get rid of them. Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. So theoretically, the bones are still around somewhere. Or do you think, the, does the water destroy the bones over time? Uh, it takes a long time because when I was treasure diving on that 1622 reg- wreck in Florida, that Spanish galleon, I found bones from those sailors. Really? Yeah. I actually brought back to Kentucky and had a burial. Really? Yeah. You buried the bones you found on the wreck in Kentucky? Yeah, on my farm. That's interesting. Yeah, I just felt like that was no place for eternal rest. Uh, wow. Maybe a nice place under a tree with an, a view. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so uh, this this giant yeah. uh, skeleton you uncovered... Uh, do you have pictures of that? I've got some slides. What do you mean by slides? Uh, like PowerPoint presentation slides? or no, like actual slides. Really? Yeah, because it was 1980 was when this excavation took place. Really? Yeah, so. And. Uh, so how old were you when this happened? High school. You were in high school? Yeah, I volunteered because. Uh, so, uh, my- you, were you working at KU in high school? No, this was before. So this is before KU. Yeah. Okay. Before UK. Or KU. Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. Okay. It was uh, Berea College and uh, University of Chapel Hill in North Carolina. But the Berea College, the guy that was in charge, was my guitar player's dad, and he was an archaeologist who had spent time in the Middle East and all over. And um, he kind of became my mentor. You know, he's the one that really got me. Uh, really involved in it and before uh he passed away he gave me his file uh, on on that area where i am Mm. a big thick file he said you're the only person i know that's interested in this kind of stuff so uh, you still have it yeah what kind of information's in there oh man so much information everything about that Indian Fort Mountain and a lot of the burial mounds in the area. Like it gives locations and uh, things that were found and excavations. And Was your giant the only giant found? Probably not. Um, A lot of those mounds around there haven't been excavated. Still? Yeah. What are they waiting for? Just is it is it one of those things where it's academics that has to be just they have to justify it through academics or is it funding or is it uh, respect for the the mound itself and the burial or what? No, uh, a lot of it is is they're on private property. Some of them, uh, and sometimes the property owner doesn't want that. A lot of times they built their house on top of these mounds. No wonder why it's haunted. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know. Uh, it's just, I don't know, uh, 
there there have been excavations though where giant bones have been found, but not so much in my area because the funding isn't really there. Uh, you know, it's and most of those excavations took took you know were years and years and years ago. Mm. I don't really know of anybody that's doing any work in burial mounds now. Um, Are you against it? I'm not. Um, I, I've explored quite a few, and uh, you know, I think I think responsible archaeology is is cool. You know, yeah. You learn a lot from it. Yeah. You know, and I know there's a lot of people that are like anti digging the burial mounds up and stuff, and yeah. you know. Um, I go back and forth on a lot of different things. You know, I don't, I'm not emotionally attached to a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the fact that you're saying you, you dug one up, I'm sure there's people listening. They're like, how could he, you know? Right. Yeah. I'm like, whatever. That's cool, man. You found a giant bone. Like, yeah, that's cool. And Let's it, talk about that. It was all done respectful and, yeah. uh, you know, ethically. Properly. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's protocols and, mm -hmm. and rules and we follow those. And, but I mean, <laughs> if we hadn't done it, nobody would have known yeah. you know and they'd still be you know I, th I think that their whole i think that site is way older than adena and uh you know adena culture i think it's way older uh what's adena culture they were the the indigenous culture that lived uh what they call the archaic period which would be uh like uh, six thousand, seven thousand years ago. Okay, and uh, while I'm, he's reaching in his bag, pulling something special out. It's magical. Uh oh, what is this? Unwrapping it with a handkerchief. That's an Adina axe. Oh. seven thousand years old. Can I hold it? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is wild. I'm holding up for the camera right now, Jack. We gotta make sure we put this on on YouTube. Oh, wow. You can see these plow marks where disc, when they were, farmers were disc in their field, they ran across it with a disc. Wow. 7,000 years old? Yeah. So like, they was this fastened by a rope here? Yeah, it was hafted onto a, a, a stick so you could use it as an axe to... This is incredible. Well, I didn't expect this when I came into the office. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. How many people found things like this and didn't didn't think anything of it and just discarded it? Lots. Yeah. That's, that's wild. And a lot of people, you know, find it. They don't know what it is. Uh, like my heart is pounding right now just holding it. Like, I, like I'm so, like this is. Somebody made that 7,000 years ago <laughs> and used it. And, and and when they made this, they never expected seven thousand years later a podcast dork being amazed by it. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like to them it's this is like there's it's like, oh, it's a stupid plastic spoon. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's wow, that's amazing, man. Yeah. That is amazing. Wow. And that came from where? Kentucky. Yeah, but like, was it from what? Where, where, where did it come from in Kentucky? Um, was it from a mound or what? No, it was from a, a farmer's field. Farmer's field. Yeah, and he just plowed it up. Yeah, and and you stumbled across it, or no, they gave it to you, or what? Uh, a buddy of mine stumbled across it, and then he knew that I'm, you know, I know the guy for this. Yeah, yeah. he can tell me what this is, you know. <sighs> and then he gave it to me. Wow. Do you know where the field that it came from? No, I don't. But recently, did you hear? Just like. A week ago, a farmer was plowing his field and hit a hoard of, they call it the Kentucky hoard, gold coins like Civil War. It was millions of dollars worth. Why not me? <laughs> That's I know, amazing. I know a spot by a oh, cedar yeah. tree. I, mean, like, 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 I might be coming up with you, you know, today. <laughs> uh, yeah. Can wow. you dig a hole? <laughs> I, I can dig a hole. I can dig a hole. Bad back and all, I can dig a hole. All right. Uh, there's your next song. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah th that, there's a story there, friends. Um, okay, so the, the excavation, the, the, uh, you have the slides. Mm. 
And, and so these slides are something that you would hold up to a light and you can see it. Yeah. Is it, it? Can you even get that printed as a picture still? I'd say you can, yeah. Where would you go for something like that? Uh, you'd probably have to send it somewhere would be my guess. Somewhere special. Yeah. It, it would, if somebody had like one of those red rooms, would they be able to do it? Like if I made yeah. one of those, probably. Yeah. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna, I'm gonna print them for you. Like probably. I'm just gonna because I don't trust people, so I don't want to send it anywhere. Yeah, it ain't coming back. <coughs> you know. <laughs> like, so if somebody's listening right now that lives within an, an hour or two from <laughs> East Tennessee, give me a shout if you if you know how to print this stuff. We'll 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 do this on the private level. If not, we could do the, the old fashioned slideshow where you drop it in and project. Oh, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 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 Do you have those slides with you? No. No. Darn it, man. I think no, I didn't bring them. No, I almost did. Next, next time I, I almost brought that whole file, and I, I had to. Oh my gosh! Travel a little lighter. I just brought one file about that thick. <laughs> he's got he's got a backpack full of treasures. Yeah, it's I amazing. I do have some treasures in here. What is that? Oh, oh. this is what? <laughs> What's that? Is that's, that the silver? That's over a pound of silver, raw silver. From the John, one of the John Swift silver mines. Are you sure it's John Swift silver mine? It has to be. I asked my great uncle was a treasure hunter, among other things, but he's the one that got me interested in this. When he, before he died, he gave me John Swift's journal and another book written. The real, well, a copy, a copy. Okay, yeah, with all the maps and stuff in it, and he gave me a riddle on how to find this mine. An actual riddle, like a paragraph. And this is your uncle? Yeah, great uncle. Great uncle. And uh, so before he died, we were sitting on the front porch, him and my grandfather and I, their brothers. And I'm like, so Uncle Oscar, where's that silver mine, you know? He's like, oh, you could walk to it from here. And I'm thinking, okay, these are the guys that told me they used to walk to the courthouse and the county seat, which is 35 miles away. <laughs> yeah. For the day and then walk home. <laughs> like you could, you could, yeah, so I'm, yeah. thinking, <laughs> I, I'm like, is that humanly possible? They're like, oh yeah, we used to do it all the time. <laughs> this is the guy that walked and rode a bike from Florida to Kentucky. <laughs> okay. okay. So I'm thinking that doesn't really narrow it down, right. you know? And, and then my grandfather interrupted him and we never got back around to the conversation. Hmm. So I had to figure out the riddle and do you know the riddle now? Yeah. Are you, are, do you feel comfortable with saying it? No, I can't. You can't say, yeah. Okay. But, uh, that, that's a chunk of silver you got from the mine. It's raw silver. Yeah. That, that came from, from the mine. When you, so you went looking for the mine and you found the mine and you found this in the mine. No, he found that in the mine. He found this in the mine. I know where the mine is. Have you been to it? No. Why? Can't get anybody to go with me. I mean, I'm saying like I know, like, and it's even I'm like so glad we're here I'm even like, right look, now. I'll share treasure with you if you can just come and dig a hole for me. <laughs> I'm not saying this is this is the way it's going to play out, but I know you're listening right now, Justin. I'll talk to him about it later. Uh, <laughs> Justin knows what I mean. So, uh, okay. So what's this? This is quartz crystal that's all over the area. Of the mine? Uh, uh, where I live. Where you live. Yeah. Everywhere. And it's got embedded in it is silver, like raw silver in the quartz crystal. Wow. There's also been gold. This found. is off your property. Yeah, the right. forty acres you own. Yeah, wow. And the creek that runs below the property, there's also been found uh, industrial grade diamonds, gold. This is right below the silver mine. So it's a okay. Okay. I don't even want to finish the job today. I just want to go to Kentucky. <laughs> like, I don't even, like, I want to call a recess on this whole recording and just bail on it. <laughs> and another thing about this quartz being everywhere, it's quartz with copper. You know, quartz, uh, every, everything in, in, in the universe vibrates with a frequency. 
quartz has the highest vibrational frequency of anything. So, for instance, like a, that's why there's energy in quartz. You know, that's why you know your your watch has got a quartz crystal in it uh, to power it, or piezoelectric. You know, that's quartz crystal energy. Okay. They actually grow crystals in space because they're more symmetrical, and they use them in you know electronics. So one of the reasons why it just popped in my head recently was why are these UFOs coming and hovering over this one spot oh. all the time, every night? Yeah. There's tons of quartz. Wow. I mean, that's a great thought. I mean, it, 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 like, is it accurate? Who knows? But it's a great connection to think about. So we haven't even talked about that, but the property you live on now, every night you can record UFOs to the point that you're you're bored with it, right? Yeah. Um, and I and I've seen video of like the one we'll just call it an orb UFO, whatever it is. Yeah. You see it flying around, and as it passes by the the power lines, the power lines start sparking. Yeah. And that was like six feet from my window from, of the from house. Me, yeah. Wow. When I was filming it. Wow. We'll get into that yeah. later. I don't want to. I don't want to um, so the the Swift Silver Mine. You know where it's at. One of them. There's more oh, than one. There's more than one. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not. I, I don't know a ton about the Swift Silver Mine. All, all, all I know. This is how I. This is how I found out about it. Um, there, uh, Justin from uh, Appalachia Intelligence Podcast. Uh, they found a, then they were here talking about it. They found a very large rock that had petroglyphs on it and it looked um, like it was trying to tell a story. And somehow they were tipped off that uh, the, the, the Swiss silver mine um, was marked by a, a rock or something. And they, so they started going down this idea of the Swiss silver mine, right? Mm. Uh, they they know where the rocks at. They found it. I have I have pictures of it. They he said, whenever you come up, we'll we'll go and 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 get it and check it out. Yeah, uh, that's really all I know much about it. So uh, you're saying there's more than one mine? Yeah, I I mean it's an interesting story. The whole story of Swift is pretty incredible. Uh, it, it, I could give you a little of the history. Sure, if you go want. ahead. Yeah, 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 he he was a. Uh, I think he was born in 1621, maybe, in, in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, was a mason. Uh, was in the shipping. Had, a, I think it was a privateer, you know, which is basically a pirate, but the queen sanctions it. So you go out and you try to, you know, steal from your, you know, other countries' vessels. So he's basically a pirate. Um he was in Alexandria, uh, Virginia, ran into a, basically a homeless dude, homeless young kid on the street uh, named Mundy, and showed him some kindness, took him in, took care of him. And in return, Mundy told him his story. Mundy had been with some French fur trappers and kidnapped by Shawnee and then Sha natives yeah okay then kidnapped by Cherokee uh -huh. from the Shawnee who kind of adopted him into their tribe which they did a lot that was just common practice but they started uh, using him to as labor to mine silver in these various mines that they had and um, so he knew where these mines were, and then eventually they trusted him enough to where he could escape. So he escaped, made his way to Virginia, and that's where he ran into Swift and told him the story. And he's like, I can show you the, where the mines are. You know, I know exactly where they are uh, because you've been so cool to me, you know. So uh, the word is that he sailed to Cuba to pick up... Uh, couple of his friends that were uh, silversmiths also, I think Guys and Jeffries was the name, came back, organized a, uh, an expedition and hiked across the Appalachians and uh, 
uh, there was, there was two different routes they took. One was up like towards Fort Pitt and down the Kanawha and Big Sandy. But they had what they called the upper line, upper mines and the lower mines. So there's more than one mine. And if you look at the different maps, the various maps that show those, you know, where they left rock carvings or signs to to show where these mines were. And if you read the diary, it talks about how they would come and they would work these mines and uh, get as much silver as they could. Uh, they would even mint coins, English crowns, which turned out to have more pure silver than actual English crowns. And, uh, and then they would make ingots and what are called pigs, basically like uh, ingots with holes in them that you can run them rope through to carry them but a lot of times they mined more silver than they could carry out so they would a lot of times they would disguise the mine by rocking it up putting brush in front of it and stuff leaf symbols on trees or rocks and um and then go go back and he would take the the coins and the, the silver back and buy more ships and he was really anti-English, so he was helping to fund some, uh, through his Mason friends, to fund some revolution-type stuff. But he kept going every year and getting more and more silver, and his groups got bigger and bigger. And uh, a lot of times the story goes that he would use uh, natives or or people to do the work and would kill them uh, when they left so they couldn't uh, tell where the location of the mines were. So there's a little bad karma there. All right, and we're back. Uh, we had to take a bathroom break there. Uh, how long, Jack, how long have we been uh, running so far? Uh, about two hours. All right, about two hours. So we're going we're gonna to kind of go for maybe another 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour or whatever. And then uh, we'll probably, tra at some point, we're going to transition into the overtime and then membership. Because like, they, just so people understand, we're going to get back on what we were just talking about. But like, um, we've we've barely scratched the surface. Yeah. I'm looking at this. I'm like, we've barely talked about the cave. The Because yeah. I started going down the archaeology route. So we are right. covering that, yeah. which is great. Uh, but, you know, your, your treasure hunting journeys and stuff, we kind of touched on a little bit, but there's just so much. And uh, it, it's it's this is one of the hardest things about doing this show is that when you have somebody like you here or even virtually and I'm, I'm, you're trying to, as the conductor of the conversation, you're trying to figure out how to bring it all together, yeah. you know? And so we're just having a conversation and seeing where things go. Um, but my Lord, um, I mean, we haven't touched the three Bigfoot encounters. We haven't touched the portal pictures, right, yeah. like, like all that. And so we, we can actually move into that if you want. I mean. we, we can, but I don't want to move away from what we were just talking about. Yeah. And you pulled out more treasures and put them on the table with no story <laughs> behind it. So like, like, let's just, let's just keep it going where we were going. So you were talking about the, the Swiss, the legend of the Swiss silver mine. Yeah. Uh, so just keep it going and we're going to just see where this conversation goes. Okay. So, uh, as I was saying, there's more than one mine and they call them the upper and lower mines. And they would, a lot of times, uh, they would have these, they would have these big mule trains to carry the silver out. Sometimes when they were carrying the silver out, they would get attacked by natives, uh, and maybe a horse or a mule got shot. And so now they've got silver that they've got to hide. So a lot of times they would bury kegs of coins or things of silver bars, you know, whatever, and they would leave uh, Masonic signs or, or other signs on trees or rocks close by to, uh, to mark it so they could find it later. And a lot of them they, didn't, they never did find later. And th that happened quite a bit where uh, they would get attacked and lose uh, some of their treasure. But eventually... Uh, he became a wealthy man and made quite a few trips uh, to these mines and uh, was going back to England and uh, helping finance uh, some of his anti-king uh, act activities with the silver. He got arrested and thrown into the Tower of London. 
and was there for years. Uh, while he was in the Tower of London, he lost most of his eyesight. So by the time he was released and came back to the States to try to pick up his mining operations, he could barely see. He had, uh, the story goes, one of the story. there's, there's many versions, but one of the story goes that this lady in Bean Station, Tennessee, helped him go out and look for these uh, treasures, these these caches, these mines. But with his bad eyesight, he could never, never find it. And then he died and left his journals and maps to the lady at Bean Station. And that's where we get the the legend from. Where are these maps and journals now? You can buy... Uh, no, the, the, the real ones. Oh, the real ones. I don't know where the real ones are. There's, they made copies, uh, uh, some drawings, uh, and I've got a couple of books. One of them is uh, by Michael Paul Henson, who's really into this and has done a great bit of research to help us all out on this. But So there's a couple of books, you know, and you can, of course, online, but... Uh, these maps, they're so uh, vague. You know, they'll have maybe a like a, a latitude on them and, uh, and all kinds of uh, secret symbols and stuff. And it's just so vague that, mm. you know, it's, it's hard to... And, of course, a lot of those trees that they made the symbols on or gone and a lot of times they would like i said they would wall up these mines to hide them and uh you know they've just been lost to time how did you find the mine that you're talking mm -hmm. about and and remind me it's because it's been a few minutes here but have you actually been to it yet no you haven't but no. you know it's there i know i know exactly where it is so so how did you find it, and how do you even know it's there if you've never been there? Okay. Uh, years of research, um, and then, you know, my uncle telling me he could walk to it from here. <laughs> but I started looking at uh, old maps, old land deeds uh, for, for the county where I live, and uh, then I would look at topo maps and satellite maps. And um, in a very old document, I found a listing of uh, more than one, but the one close to me, a silver mine. So it took a long time to find the right map, an old map uh, that showed it on the map and said silver mine, X marks the spot. Mm. Well, that's the creek below my house. and. So I started asking some of the old timers around there, uh, my neighbors, uh, you know, have you ever heard about a silver mine or an old mine around here? Well, there's tons of old mines. It's, you know, coal mines and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I told this one guy, this old timer guy, uh, where I, it looked like it was on the map. And he said, oh, yeah, I know where that is that's right below the pour over on the creek and you go up to the left and then it's right there on the right. And, uh, that's exactly where it showed on the map that I had found. And, uh, I talked to a couple more people who actually have a silver mine on the, I guess it's probably the top of that mountain, uh, that they've been trying to work recently in the last few years. So I know, I know exactly where it is. And this is on your property. It's not on my property. It's not. Okay. It's, it, it borders my property. Like, uh. Who owns it? It's, uh, National Forest, I think. So if you found it, you'd have to talk to them about it then. It's not like you could just start digging in there, right? Yeah. If it's National Forest. Actually, now that I think about it, I think that's the section that's not National Forest. There's borders on both sides. Mm. I think that's private land. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would talk to the landowner, you mm -hmm. know, for sure. I know where a gold mine is too. 
Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> this is the gold mine is right, right below the, uh, uh, the sacred mountain I told you about. Well, right there, the civil war burial ground and the Indian burial ground, uh, that my father built a lake over. Yeah. Well, right at the head of that hollow is a gold mine. And I talked to the property owner. He said they worked it back in the 18, late 1800s, mid 1800s. But with the technology that they had, they, they played it out. But that was mid 1800s. He said, you can go up there anytime you want, take your metal detector and you probably find some gold. And you haven't been up there yet. I haven't. Because you're waiting for somebody. Exactly. You found that somebody. <laughs> like, like my job is to talk about crazy stuff and going on the journeys is part of the job. And that would be so awesome because <laughs> I want to do it and I can't find anybody to go with me. Which baffles me. Yeah. Which baffles me. But maybe... I maybe think people are too busy. They work. I'm retired, so yeah. I've got all the time in the world. Maybe the idea... Maybe it's... Maybe I'm over estimating about the number of people who have an adventurous spirit, you know, because I have a show where a lot of people that listen to the show have adventurous yeah. spirits, but maybe as a broad whole, people don't have that they don't. as life beats them up. No, they don't. Well, you found somebody <laughs> who is a very unique situation. That's great because- And I'm like, close to you. Because like I said, the only person I know wants to go out at night in the rain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll do that too, but I mean, like- I, No. Oh my gosh. Jack, you down? Jack says he's yeah, yeah, he's right down. On. We're we're doing we're, it. We're we're like we're <laughs> like very much doing it. Yeah, I mean, so, um, yeah, I mean, you're two and a half hours from me. I mean, I like as we said last night. You said we could we could stay at your For place. Sure, yeah, but I mean, in, in all reality, if I had something to do the next day, like say I have an interview scheduled, right. I could drive up, leave here at six, be there at eight thirty, spend true. a day hunting legends, yeah, be back for bedtime it's to true, kiss the kids good night, yeah. It's wild, man. I am so... Well, that's the show, everybody. <laughs> we're leaving. We're going we're, hunting right we're now. We're going hunting. Forget about the rest of the stories. We're not interested in sharing with you. <laughs> we're we're going to be self-serving today. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, so, all right. That's the Swiss Silver Mine. Yeah. Uh, at least one of them. Right. Uh, you... You know where there's a gold mine. You have permission to go there. Mm -hmm. Definitely going to do that. Um, you mentioned last night, and you hinted at it here, where you know where there's a stash, and literally you're almost to it, but Correct. your physical condition prevents you from finishing the job. Right. Um, tell, them, tell the people about this. Yeah, so there's a, a Civil War camp where General Grant camped for... Uh, on the way to the Battle of Richmond. And they basically fought from this campground, five minutes from the house, <laughs> all the way to <laughs> the Battle of Richmond. And uh, where they camped, my great-grandfather was camped there as one of the soldiers. Uh, I've heard this story. But uh, so I went down there with a metal detector, and I knew that back in the day, historically, when the armies would come through people would hide their belongings because the armies would come through and take everything they had, money, livestock, food, whatever, you know. So they would usually bury their uh, valuables in a mason jar, uh, in a flower bed, uh, where flowers would come back up and they would always know there's the bank right there or a great big tree. So in this area, I found an old house site with uh, a few wildflower beds still there. So I started detecting it around, and then on the way, I found a giant old-growth cedar tree. So I started hitting that with the metal detector, and it immediately lit up gold and silver, just crazy, singing gold and silver. So all I had was my little spade, and it was in the middle of summer, hard, hard dirt. So I, I could only dig down them. 12 inches or so but it still kept hitting just just another maybe foot below where i had dug to 
So I'm like, well, I got to come back here with a real shovel and uh, try to dig it up. So I did go back with the real shovel and my buddy, the one that likes to go out at night in the dark. But <laughs> as we're heading to this spot, he wanders off and gets lost somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> he, he saw a shiny rock in the creek or something and got distracted. So I, I get to the spot and I turn around. And I'm like, where is he? <laughs> I don't, he's gone. What kind of friend is this? What kind of friend is this? Oh, I, I've got stories on what kind of friend this is. <laughs> Bro, stay on mission. Stay on mission. Yeah. For the love of God, stay on mission. His attention span is like a gnat. Jeez. So I don't Dude. know where he is. And I'm standing there with the shovel, two torn rotator cuffs. And I'm trying to dig and it's just not happening. Uh, Cause there's roots you got to get around and stuff. And, and I waited around and waited around, shot some video, tried to dig some more, and finally just gave up. It's like, well, I better go find him. He's lost. You know? Wow. 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 So, so I hope nobody has gone back there and yeah. found the hole and be like, oh, what's, what's there? Yeah. yeah. Is it a high is it a high traffic area? No, no. Okay, at all. so the yeah. odds are probably pretty yeah. slim. Yeah, it's not easy to get to. So I I I don't know much about um, uh, metal detecting, mm -hmm. but I do know that there could be uh, things that read as gold that aren't gold. Is that a possibility here? No. So it's too strong of a signal. Yeah. So there's no false read possibility. Not. At you all. know there's gold I there. I know there's gold there, and probably silver, and it's probably coins, probably old, yeah. you know, gold dollars and. 1800s wow like that cash they just found it's probably worth a couple million dollars wow all i want to do is pay off my truck in my house like that's, that's probably I, enough <laughs> that's all i want like I, i'm not uh, maybe get a cow you know yeah. or two you know a couple, a couple more chickens some more pigs you know you're getting out of control, Tony. I know. <laughs> That's all I want. Like, you know, it's just, it's just very simple. I just want to be a very simple life. I, right. I, I'm trying to bring it down a couple of notches and just live very simplistic. Exactly. Uh, well, let's go. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm dead serious, though. We, yeah. We're coming up very yeah. soon. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we, w I, I just got to, because my schedule is obviously slammed. Like, I had somebody yeah. who... Uh, shout out to Deep Share Podcast. He he asked me to come on his show to record, and and in the time frame he asked, I was, I, think I I literally don't have the time. Man. Yeah. Um. And so uh, and I'm looking at my schedule right now, right here. I'm just like, we're gonna make it happen. I just gotta figure out how, you know. <laughs> but uh, before winter, uh, definitely, Beth, definitely. Before you, before you even stop thinking about this conversation, <laughs> yeah, we'll be there. Uh, but. Okay, so these are some of the the treasures that are within range of your where you live. Right. Some are ancient legends that you have tracked down. Some are things that you stumbled across. Uh, not to mention the treasure of the Native American artifacts that that have been found in the area. You found uh, you, you excavated a giant skeleton. You were there. Yeah. You laid eyes on this thing. Like, like, did you touch it? Did you did you lay your hands on it? No, no. How close did you get to it? Oh, you know, right next to it. Jeez. Um, but yeah, we had to be massive. Yeah, yeah, massive. I heard that um, a skeleton that's eight feet tall, let's say, like the actual body is even more physically imposing than what the skeleton even would be because of the meat that be on the bones and right. things like that. Yeah. So what, with the skeleton that you saw, like let's just talk about the shoulders. Like how wide were the shoulders, would you say? It's hard to say because uh, it was just bones and uh, it had those copper, hammered copper plates across it. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't like it was it was kind of articulated, uh, not, not not like laying flat, kind of in a weird position. Okay. Shifted over time, I'm assuming. Yeah. But the bones were, I mean, you could just tell by looking at the bones that they were bigger, you know, like more. Mm -hmm. uh, Dense. Yeah. More. More, more volume. volume. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
That's why, I mean, did you have any gauge at, I mean, this is, you were young, high school, I think you yeah. said. Like, did you have any gauge as the historic nature of what you were looking at? Not at all. No. At what point did you start realizing, wow, that was actually something It wasn't unique. until uh, years, years and years later, like maybe late 90s, maybe. Really? That I, I started doing research, no, mid 90s. Into the the burial mounds and the giant bones found all over, you know, the Ohio Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of those stories from the, the people, the natives were like, we didn't build these. They were here when we got here. Right. Know? Yeah. yeah. I, I, that's something that I've heard, uh, which just blows history out of the water. Yeah. You know? Uh, what's your take on the whole giant skeleton, giant beings thing? I mean, like I come from a very uh, biblical Nephilim perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your take on all that stuff? Well, that's, I mean, that's definitely uh, a theory and, and mm -hmm. could be possible. And if you, and if you, like I, you know, I've studied religion, I'm ordained, so I've studied all these different various religions and mythologies, and there's a common thread that runs through all of them. And uh, one of that is of giants or, you know, I think, I think it's a real, real phenomenon. And I don't, I think, you know, I think they were probably, a, a, you know, there's Native American stories about how, there, there was a war between them and the giants. These giants mm. were cannibals, and um, Lovelock Cave. Before this is before Lovelock, really? Yeah, this was this was in the East Coast. Algonquin, like, uh, happened. I think Ohio River, maybe, or maybe maybe north, but somewhere around there. They they talked about having to fight these this giant tribe. And, uh, you know, eventually they wiped them out because they were killing and eating their tribe members. And, uh, so there's, there's, and then Lovelock Cave, there's that story too, you know? So there's plenty of indigenous stories about it. Um, so it, and it, it's not just a, a biblical story, which it, it, it is, of course. And then if you go to... A lot of those biblical stories are even older, older, older stories uh, from Sumer or Uruk or, uh, or sometimes they're just common uh, shared ideas. Like the, there's a collective conscious and a collective unconscious, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so those ideas can, you know, have developed in many different religions and many different mythologies. And uh, I think there's something to it, you know? Yeah. So you, so you, when you think back at that giant skeleton you found. Uh, I think it was one of the older race of people that. You're just, you're not thinking it was just a really tall person. No, no. I think it, it was of those people that the natives were saying that were there before them that built the mounds. With what it was wearing, it seems like it was buried like that. So it must have been maybe a, a respected warrior. Yeah, he was probably a, a chief or a shaman. Gotcha. Probably. Because you talked about the armored plates in the yeah. front. And the, how how old is that? How far does back, back does that go? So you said it was bronze, right? Copper. Copper. And it's Great Lakes copper. It came from, you know, you can analyze uh, and find out where the copper came from. It came from the Great Lakes. And they found these, you know, Stone Age and Neolithic copper mines on up in the Great Lakes on some of these islands. And the path, you know, goes straight from there right up to the Great Lakes. Mm. So there's a lot of trade, you know. And so this this uh, excavation that you were involved in, is it documented somewhere or is it lost in time? I've got all the documentation. Uh It was published, so somewhere uh, it's published. You know, you, you academically published. Mm -hmm. um, I've run across one other guy from the college who knows about it and has 
maybe, I don't know if I saw a website or a story somewhere where he was talking about it. Uh, okay. So. Wow. Because, I mean, I was just thinking, like, uh, all these other stories that come out with these giant skeletons, it's like, oh, no, it never happened. You know, is, yeah. it, is this one of those cases where I got somebody who's like, oh, I was there, you know? <laughs> the skull ended up uh, in possession of one of the, it may have been a geologist at the college. And then he passed away, and it ended up in a safe deposit box somewhere. I've got the correspondence. I'd have to go over it again. It's been 20 years since I've read it, but I think they tracked down the skull was the only part they could track down. Hmm. It was in a, it was in the wife safe deposit box somewhere. What? Yeah, the the wife of the uh the guy that ended up with the skull, he he was at the college. It was in a safe deposit box? She she when he left it to her I think she put it in a safe deposit box somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got all the, the correspondence between the college and DC and Smithsonian trying to locate this. And yeah, it's pretty interesting. Oh, that, that, this is a treasure hunt in itself. Like, yeah, just we, the research. Uh, can you imagine if you could f track down and it's not locked up in some kind of museum or something and somebody has. Yeah. I'd have to look at that again and see where it ended up. I don't even want it. Like I, I like, <laughs> like can I just come and visit it? You know? Yeah, like right. I, I would I yeah. just want to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. I like you. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> this like is you, this dude. this is Hey. This is really cool. And Jack's okay. You know, he's okay. He's, okay. he's over there switching the cameras. He's, he's doing all right. Uh, wow. This is amazing. Okay. So we covered a lot of ground here and we, 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 we got out of order, but it's okay. This is just really, it, it just evolved. Yeah. Uh, I want, I want to talk about these three other things here on the table that you got out though. These uh, are, uh, these are native American paint pots. What's a paint pot? Like they put paint in it to, Oh, yeah. to put on their face. Yeah. So they, they, they would make a paint and then they would wipe it on their face. Yeah, like take some red ochre or some iron oxide, you know, and add a little water to it. What's this made out of? Is it like a, it's like a, like I a think, clay or something? I or? think this is, this is pottery, I believe. Really? Yeah. I think this was, uh, this, I think this was just a rock that they chipped at. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And this is a, it's called a, archaeologists call it a shaft straightener. Uh, when you're making arrows and you want your shaft to be straight, you can take your shaft and run it through here to make it perfectly straight different sizes incredible and then they would run run a piece of rawhide through it and wear it like a gorget it was like it would, it would be like uh somebody carrying uh, uh something to sharpen your knife with today yeah like a functional so tool that was a, wow can i see that yeah so wow and i have quite a few of these and i've got quite a few of these too i have so many stone tools that archaic stone tools it's ridiculous hundreds at, at your house, yeah, really, yeah, and that you, that you found. Mm -hmm. Every time I go, I I find them. I've never found anything cool in my entire life. I I, I had a friend once <laughs> <laughs> that him, his brother, and his younger brother, uh, older brother and younger brother, all three of them could just walk outside and find four leaf clovers. Yeah, everywhere. I've yeah. never found one. Yeah, I was. I'd be with them and they're finding them, <laughs> and I couldn't find them. I had a friend that could walk out and go, I'm going to find an arrowhead today or I'm going to find a spear point. And then he'd walk out and look down and there'd be one. How do you do that? But yeah, there's uh, this creek below my house. There's, there's two. There's one on either side and I live on the top of the mountain. But the one side is where the silver mine stuff is and the other side is where the cave and all that is. And that's where I find most of the stone and tools. And Between the silver mine and the cave. Uh, on the cre the creek that that runs through the cave, that's where you find most of the artifacts. Wow. Well, 
And that's not even mentioning Bone Hollow. What's that? That is where uh, in the 1600s, a slave ship landed in Virginia and brought smallpox. And it traveled over to Kentucky eventually. And all these natives in this tribe got it, and they all ended up in this one hollow and died. Hundreds of natives. And they call it Bone Hollow. Because you find the bones. Nobody really knows about it other than there's a historical report of this family who settled that property would take their wagon down by the creek and load it full of bones, drive it back to the top of their property, spread them on their fields, and set them on fire for fertilizer. He was like, yeah, I never wanted to eat anything out of that garden. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Are you serious? <laughs> but the thing is, you know... They had all of their possessions with them, and they died there. So think of all the different artifacts that you could just, in this one little area that you could just, and I want to go there, and I've been trying to get How, somebody to go with me. <laughs> I'm going to call this, ep this episode, I've been trying to find somebody to go with me. <laughs> How far, is it within a five-minute drive to the house? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable! I, I don't even know if we covered that on the show. I'll just give people at the end of this 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 segment here. I'll, I'll say uh, you typically don't tra travel more than five minutes from the house yeah. because of the accidents you've been involved in, and it's just kind of I guess more like a PTSD type thing. That and I've spent my whole life on the road traveling and not that interested in. Yeah, I'm just you, know. you got everything you need five minutes right. from the house. I mean, like yeah, I don't have any reason really to leave. Yeah. You know, my county. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I feel the same way. I I, I, I I drive I drive from my house to here 20 minutes. That's pretty much as far as I go. I don't go into Knoxville. I just go back and forth. Yeah. But that's different than you. Like I <laughs> wow, man. Wow. This is unbelievable. So uh I think this would be a good spot to transition into the overtime. Um and we'll get into some uh, some of these wild experiences and we'll see where we go with the overtime and we'll see uh, what parts we save for the members episode on Thursday. But uh, we can talk about some of the Bigfoot stuff. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about the Bigfoot stuff. We haven't even touched about how did you get employed at a deep underground military base? <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's a funny story. That's man. a funny story. I bet it is. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll get into the cave talk. We'll just see where things go. And we haven't even touched on the UFOs really in the, the, I mean, we did yeah. a little bit, but the, uh, the the orbs and the portal and all that stuff. So, uh, dude, I appreciate you sharing all this stuff. And I, I just feel like this, whatever it's been, two and a half hours, three hours, it's been just going by in a blur. And yeah, like, it doesn't seem like it. And yeah. I, I feel like, did we even touch on anything? Yeah, we had to have touched on something, something. but like, <laughs> but what? I don't know. We just, we'll have to listen back and figure it out. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. All I know is I'm very excited right now. So it must have been a good conversation. Uh, and if people don't like it, I liked it. It is what it is. Uh, but I appreciate you being here. If you're a yeah, member man. right now, you can just switch over to the overtime segment on the website or on the app and listen to more conversation. Uh, if you're not a member, I really appreciate you sticking around for this long conversation and having a good, hopefully a good time listening to us chit chat back and forth about uh, his his wild life that he's been living and that he has lived. And we are going to dive more into that in the overtime. But if you're not a member, it's cool. Uh, we appreciate you being here either way. And until next week, stay safe, take care. And remember, the truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Bye. They want to box me in, take my oxygen, choke my hopes and then leave me to the
push me down and I'll go high.